If we can have everyone take a seat. Welcome to the second day of the Conference on the Gender Dimensions of Weather and Climate Services. You all are very welcome. We're going to start off today looking at the issues of public health. This, we have an outstanding high-level panel. And then after their discussion, we will have a 30-minute break, and then we'll move to working sessions. So without further ado, I'll wait one more minute. Okay, I'm going to turn this over to our panel. Thank you very much. So, do you hear me better? It seems so. My name is Elizabeth Zem. I'm from the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute in Basel, and I'm moderating this plenary. The plenary is on uh, health, with a health focus, weather and climate and health and gender. Um, and I would li just like to stress two points before we start. One is the aim is that we raise awareness and um, showcase good practices, and you hear some of it. And I'd also like to mention one point that it is about, you will hear, uh, I guess, quite a bit about uh, empowerment of women to improve effectiveness of climate and, cl and of weather and climate services. And the um, rationale behind is that weather and climate vulnerability on one side, and also the adaptive capacity often differ by gender. So we'll, we'll have to pay attention to how this fits, feeds into uh, all the aspects we want to discuss. We have uh, several panelists here, and I'd like to introduce them now to you. I'm starting. Uh, on, actually, on my left side with, uh, with Judy Omumu, who will, have, who will start with a keynote speaker. Uh, Judy Omumbo is a health researcher uh, in a public health research department in uh, Kenya from the Kemri Welcome Trust uh, research program, and you'll hear her soon uh, for the introduction here. Then, far on, far on the left, we have Laura Fortone. She is the permanent representative of the U.S. Uh, units, the United States of America with uh, WMO. And you'll hear also some input from her. Then on my right, we have Professor Virginia uh, Murray. She's from the U.K. She's consultant in uh, global disaster risk reduction. Uh, and she is the vice chair of UNSDR from the Science uh, and Technology, Technical Advisory Group, and uh, you will also have some input from her side. Then we just are happy that we have Maria Neira with us, the Director of the Department of Public Health, Environmental and Social Determinants of Health of WLJO. Welcome. Uh, and then, if you go further, we have Dr. Niri Raholi Jao, she is head of the Applied Research Services uh, in Madagascar in the National Meteorological Office. And she is also a co-coordinator uh, of the WMO Climate and Health pilot, of a pilot project. And you hear from her also some input on uh, actually a concrete project. She is further involved in, uh, in reporting the export. She is, report, she is an expert reviewer in uh, technical reports, and you'll hear on that, I guess, as well. So that is the panel we have, and the structure of this plenary will be that we first have a, a keynote from Judy Momo, then we'll have inputs from the panels that will go up to about um, 10 o'clock, and then we have some time for questions, for in answers from comments from your side also, and we'll try to make the time up to 10.30 to not delay the whole, the whole um, conference. Okay, so I'm happy to give the word to Jody. Judy, you say? Yes, <laughs> okay, for her uh, introductory keynote. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for your introduction. And um, I'd like to say good morning to all of my colleagues here. It's a real pleasure to be able to open this session this morning and really talk to um, Halle Kutval, who has invited me to say it would be great to be amongst people of like mind for three days. And so far, it's been an experience of, of really being with people of like mind, people who look like me, people whose life experiences are the same as mine. It's a great pleasure to be here to talk about gender. Um, I had a, a deep thought about what I should share today, but my experience has been for many years, uh, many of the past few years, working in the policy interface between research and an implementation of policy. My background is as an epidemiologist. For many years I have worked with malaria and other vector-borne diseases and really got to the point where we realize sometimes our research is great, but as researchers, we're often not very good at, at um, selling our research to people. I'm a firm believer that policy must be driven by research, but I'm also aware of the reality that very often it's not. So today, I wanted to talk about some of the policy issues related to addressing gender in climate and health, uh, climate sensitive diseases. How do I get to the next slide? <laughs> Right, thank you. Right, um, we've discussed a lot about how health impacts, how climate impacts health. We understand that there are di direct impacts and there are indirect impacts. When there's a hurricane, people get injured, they lose, they get displaced, and, and so on and so forth. And in the long term, they might also develop diseases. When there's flooding, there's problems with diarrhea, there's problems of, of uh, the other nature. And really, what makes people vulnerable is how they are organized socially. Okay? I'm not going to go into all of the diseases that are climate sensitive and, and, and the diseases that are caused by climate problems, because my colleagues at the WHO have uh, done this very well. I'd like to point you to a paper by the WHO, a discussion paper on gender, climate change and health. The reference is at the bottom of that slide there to have a look at that. So for my talk, I just try to, to focus on what some of the policy implications are. And just to be sure, one, a few minutes to go back to school, what we're talking about. What is gender? How do you differentiate this from sex? One sex is just determined by biological and physiological characteristics. What makes a person female? What makes a person male? Whereas, whereas gender, what we're interested in, are the social construct of what, what your role in society is, because this is what really determines your vulnerability when climate disasters happen or climate impacts fall upon a community. Okay. So just this is gender determines what is valued in a woman or what is valued in a man. In a woman, it's perhaps her caregiving. So in the immediate aftermath of a disaster, the women need to be able to take care of the children, often at the expense of their own health. In the long term, perhaps, the men need to rebuild the society, also exposing them to being outside, perhaps if they're toxic stimulants, um, uh, there's toxic stimuli still in the, in the atmosphere, in the air, they're exposed to that, and so on and so forth. Now, um, one important issue that we are going to be discussing a lot, I hope, in this session, in our discussions following this uh, panel um, session, is gender mainstreaming. What does that mean? It's an organizational strategy to really make gender run through every single thing within the planning of policies within an organization and so on and so forth. We know that very often gender is seen as a sort of soft activity that is handled by a group of women in a sub-department of a sub-department of the organization because people don't understand it, people are worried about talking about it, and then it's also not politically correct to complain about people, about women talking about women's issues or, or groups of, of um, society talking about their own issues that are considered small. 
So this is about making gender a central part of every decision that we make with regard to policy and also decisions made for funding, decisions made for programs and so on and so forth. Right, in the sphere of, of, of gender, um, I'd like to talk about the international policy instruments that are already in place. We have a right to be talking about gender and really at the international policy level, a lot has already been put in place for policies to be made in climate and so on and so forth. The WHO, for example, has had two resolutions at the World Health Assembly, one in 2007, which, has, which adopted the integration of gender analysis into the WHO, the World Health Organization, at all levels. Also, they have policies with regard to health risks associated with climate change. These were um, listed out in the WHA, uh, World Health Association Assembly Resolution in 2008 also. So on the health side, there are international policy in instruments that support the integration at the top level of gender in policy making for climate change. You are all aware, even perhaps more than myself, about the Beijing Platform for Action, which is really pushing for women to be acti actively involved in their own decision making, and really to have women issues very high in policy level uh, and in all areas of development. And then, of course, the Global Framework for Climate Services, which again emphasizes the mainstreaming of gender. So we're all covered. Whatever you want to do with gender to, and related to health uh, is covered by international policies. However, not much has been done about, about uh, including gender in policies in health. And I set out to try and find out why is this so? Is it that people aren't interested? Is it that there aren't uh, proper channels for people to, to put gender in the forefront? Or what exactly is going on? There's been a um, research for guiding policy has not really considered gender. Um, I did a little exercise to try and find out who has done some research for mainstreaming, uh, mainstreaming policy. And uh, simply what we do normally as researchers, we go onto the internet and find publications. What sort of publications have there been in the past few years, uh, or, or even been many years, over many years, related to gender and climate and health? Okay. We found, what I did find was that policies at national level have not mainstreamed gender. gender. We look at the, the national adaptation plans for action for countries at country level, and I found that perhaps only in Bangladesh is there a plan that has mentioned gender in the, in the sense that you know, the, the, they, they need to talk about men and women when they're, when they're um, looking at data. But other, other NAPAs have not really looked at, have not really looked at gender in the way that it's expected for mainstreaming purposes. Okay. Now, without actual gender-related uh, research in health, it's not going to be possible for policies to be developed that actually look at gender. Why is this such a big problem? I think, well, on the disease side, and from my experience, it's been quite difficult to find out, to understand the processes of many diseases. One, for example, uh, climate sensitive diseases, the ones that are transmitted by, by vectors, or any diseases that have a part of their transmission cycle within the environment and therefore are affected by climate and the environment. There's very little that's understood about transmission patterns very little that's understood about the disease biology. There's very little that's understood about the development of immunity. And what complicates all of this is that um, there are social factors that run alongside what's going on with the biological processes that are also still not clearly understood. Now, the basis of the science, very often what happens is uh, you find somebody says, for malaria, for example, it's impacted by rainfall, it's impacted by temperature. So let's get some rainfall data, let's get some temperature data, put it in a box, 
the box is the model, shake it around and come out with a, a, a model of uh, risk for malaria and so on. But you don't consider other social processes, socioeconomic processes that might be going alongside these kind of um, biological and, and environmental processes that are happening that impact disease transmission. Now, there's still a lot of uncertainty, as you all well know, with climate models as well. Um, I have worked with this a lot, having worked um, quite extensively with, with national programs to, to help them understand how to use climate information. Basically, what, asking them, what do you need? What do you need to know? What do you need to know about the rainfall? What do you need to know about the climate? And so on and so forth. They're very impressed with climate models, but sometimes those climate models are not designed to answer the questions that are needed. I think one area that's not been addressed um, at all well is actually producing good seasonality profiles for use with um, diseases that have seasonality. Helping people to understand that if you're looking at a seasonal disease, you need seasonal data. If you're looking at a disease that has impacts in the uh, interdecadal cycle, you need data that matches that. So actually matching the types of data in time and space for whatever disease you're understanding. Now there's a whole plethora of diseases and they all behave differently. And this is how, and this is, this is where the, the difficulties start with producing research that is relevant for, uh, for understanding climate and its impacts, and then going further to add the gender aspects. Um, yes, I think I, I've talked through this slide. Um, I think uh, my colleagues and I have also uh, looked at some of the research needs that, that, that could be prioritized for uh, research on, on health and climate. And uh, I'll just go through the list quickly. Firstly is understanding the mechanisms with which climate impacts the transmission and the geographical distribution of disease, which I've talked about. One important aspect is really using uh, climate maps and so on, other types of population maps, to, mo to map populations at risk in time and in space, particularly in time, that's been very difficult. Understanding the contribution to, of climate to trends and disease trends. We find that for many, disease, for many diseases, malaria, they, for example, in Africa, across the continent there's been a uh, epidemiologic transition where transmission has reduced over the years in many places. Um, a lot has been said about the contribu to contribution of improved socioeconomic conditions, the contribution of all the funding that has put, been put into malaria control and so forth. But what we've been finding in many places is that this does not really account for all of the reduction in transmission. And people are looking at climate issues as well. Sometimes the year when you do an impact assessment is a much drier year than the year when you started to do an implementation program and so on. So understanding how much of that reduction in transmission has been attributable to climate is still an area that uh, needs more investigation. And then one thing which I put there in, in red is just an improved understanding of where gender fits into all this. this uh, as I'm going to show you in a few uh, slides later, has not been addressed adequately at all. The problem with not um, having policies that address gender is that they tend to make the gender inequalities, it, it tends to make the gender inequalities even more serious. Um, not addressing gender is likely to lead to excess mortality in women, so the consequences are pretty um, extensive. We need to start thinking about gender and really advocate for this. It's important, it's not just an interest of, you know, women are again fighting for something for their rights or, and we, we also need to remember that gender does include men as well. They have their own vulnerabilities and um, I think we, we really have a challenge as colleagues working in this field and really scientists, implementers, the top level here with the, with the UN agencies and so on, to advocate for proper gender mainstreaming. And, uh, ooh. I'm not sure how I missed that slide, but I, I wanted to actually in, include that. This is a little search that I did looking for 
Who has been doing research work on gender? Simply doing a Medline search. One study was done, I found, by Preet et al. in, in 2010, looking, just using PubMed, uh, Web of Science, and looking at Google to see how many publications there have been that look at climate and health. Then when you add the term climate, uh, climate change, first of all, climate change and health, climate change and human health and gender, and finally, climate change, human health and policy. What you find is that in 2010, there were several publications on, on, climate, and, on climate change. But then if you add issues of health onto that, the number of publications reduces quite dramatically to 879, as you can see in the, 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 the middle cell there. If you add gender, suddenly there are no publications on climate change and health because nobody has looked at gender in this aspect. Then if you ask, add policy, Again, not much was done in 2010. So I was interested to see between 2010 and, 14 year, and four years later, when the world is really aware and conscious about, uh, about climate change, climate change and health and, and trying to raise it to policy level, has there been any change? And as you can see, there hasn't really. There's still very, very little uh, has been done on climate change and health and policy. Okay, this is a very rough guide to, to a rough um, indication of what's been done in the research world. But it does point to an important thing, that research is still very, very far away. With this kind of level or this kind of non-research, it will not be possible for us to really raise the amount of information that is required by our policy makers to, to mainstream gender at all, or even to understand the role of health in climate change. And certainly, when we get down to the policy level, there's, there's nothing, really nothing at all. Um, there's one journal, though, the Global Health um, Action, Global Health Action, um, which emphasizes uh, global health issues and their relation to policy and implementation, where I found, 15 art I found 15 articles that fit within the category where they've looked at climate change, they've looked at health, they've looked at gender, they've looked at policy. And then I reviewed the 15 articles and found that actually only five of them cover these topics. They tend to be studies of heat waves and how one, one gender is affected more than the other. But um, it still it doesn't cover very much. So, I can see Elizabeth is tapping her watch, which happily relieves me from speaking anymore. But I would like to leave you with one challenge. Many of you are researchers, and uh, you are all colleagues. Uh, you've seen the jovial entrance into this room as you all meet each other. There's a great value in collaborations and understanding from the health side and from the climate side what, what sort of research needs to be put together what sort of research priorities that we need to, to raise in order to start to address this very important issue. So um, I hope that uh, the deliberations that we have the rest of the morning will come up with some good um, outputs and some good um, action plans. I'm sure this will be the case because you all look very eager. And um, I just would like to also thank you for listening and your attention for this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charlie, and thank you also for uh, stressing, focusing on research, the, bringing up the research issues. And as we have seen uh, with, from her publication search, we are really on the start of connecting climate, health, and gender. So we are in a, actually in a, in a new phase of how we look into these issues. I'm happy now to pass on the word to uh, Virginia Murray. And you will hear a bit another focus. So uh, please, Virginia, would you go on? Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here as part of the high level plenary on health, weather, climate, health and gender. I'm going to try and take you on the next stage of the policy story towards the post-2015 framework for disaster risk reduction. As you know, there is a real opportunity... Is it on? Is it on? 
Thank you. There is a real opportunity in 2015 for these three high-level UN frameworks to work together. The first is the Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, which will come in in March 2015. The next are the Sustainable Development Goals, which include climate and disaster issues, and of course the Climate Change Agreements in December next year. I have had the great privilege of being part of the Intergovernmental Panel Special Report on Managing the Risks of Extreme Events and Disasters to Advance Climate Change Adaptation, which has included gender, gender issues. And this report has had significant input on many governments. But it's not just that one we need to mention, it's the synthesis report that came out on Sunday. It has two statements on disaster risk reduction. The first is the integration of adaptation into planning, including policy designs. Decision making and decision making can promote synergies with development and disaster risk reduction. The next is improving institutions as well as coordination and cooperation in governance that can help overcome regional constraints associated with mitigation, adaptation and disaster risk reduction. This was stated with very high confidence. But these need to link to Hyogo Framework for Action, which has been in place since 2005 to 2015, which is building the resilience of nations and communities to disasters. This has been a very successful framework, bringing together the five key functions of governance, risk identification, assessment, monitoring, and early warning, which is key in climate services, but knowledge management and education, reducing underlying risk factors, and finally, preparedness for effective response and recovery. The timeline to the 2015 Disaster Risk Reduction Framework is increasingly close, as it's going to be agreed in March next year, and then ratified, we hope, at the General Assembly next year in, in New York between September and November. We have our large prep, prep, preparation committee, the second preparation committee, later this month, where we hope some of these issues will be addressed. But most importantly, the groups participating in the post-2015 disaster risk reduction consultations include the public sector with national governments who are going to sign the framework and many other intergovernmental organisations, local governments, mayors and parliamentarians, but it's the private actors that I particularly want to commend, including the very powerful women's groups who are part of this process. And it is a real privilege to be working with them, although I work particularly in the academic and scientific community, where I sit as the vice chair of the UNISDR Science and Technical Advisory Group, but also bring my Public Health England hat as a public health consultant in dis global disaster risk reduction to work. In the first preparatory committee in July, the call for science was really strong. Out of the 65 statements from countries and country groups of the 87, 65 of them called for science. And out of the 10 major group statements, eight of them called for science. And this reflects the meetings we've had in Africa, where there have been many women's groups discussing climate issues, sustainability development, and disaster risk reduction in May this year, but also the All Americas group, which covered the whole of the Americas, Asia, which covered the whole of the Asian region. We've had the Arab League, the Pacific, and indeed this is the European Forum, which called for an international scientific advisory mechanism in order to strengthen the evidence base to inform decision making. And this was picked up very much by the joint United Nations statement that was presented at the first preparatory committee meeting, which was written on behalf of the World Meteorological Organization, the World Health Organization, the World Bank, and many others, including UN women, who all called for the UN system supporting the proposed creation of an international science advisory mechanism to strengthen the evidence base for implementation and monitoring of the new framework. There are four key functions which very much reflect the call for this session of synthesis, assessment, advisory, review and monitoring that we see as the science needs, but equally capacity building. And that is such a strong message from this conference, as well as communication and engagement at national, but very much at local levels as well. The new Zero Order Draft came out on the 20th of October. It is a very powerful instrument. Science is truly represented in it, and so is gender. 
It calls for a gender, age, disability and cultural perspective that should be integrated in disaster risk management. And women, women are critical to effectively managing disaster risk and designing, reinforce, resourcing and implementing gender responsive disaster risk reduction policies, plans and programs. So a really call, strong call for women. But unfortunately, the idea of a mechanism is currently lost. So the conclusion is that might fit with the draft statement that is being proposed from this conference, and you had Margareta Wallström here yesterday, that we invite her as the special representative of the Secretary General for Disaster Risk Reduction to draw the statement from this conference to the attention of the third UN World Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction to be held in Sendai in Japan in March on mobilizing women's leadership in disaster risk reduction. A really strong call, which we hope that the next post-2015 framework will reinforce. So we have this incredible opportunity for 2015, where all these three programs and frameworks will come together. And we hope very much that the women's voice will be heard, that disaster risk reduction will reflect the needs for women. And we hope that weather and climate and health will be properly reflected. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you for this very clear demonstration how, how this development went in, in uh, establishing a framework. May I just ask one question? This broad participatory work you did with, from, with different groups of people, different areas worldwide, can you say where that had most impact, in the, where, that, where that translated most in this new policy framework? I think, I think the problem with disasters is that they are increasing around the world. The impact upon humans is huge. Their livelihoods is really frightening. The economic impacts are enormous. But fortunately, the death rate from the evidence that we have seems to be dropping. But we're really worried that health must be included in the longer term to understand the burden of disease from disasters. The new framework will last between 20 to 30 years. It's a huge call, a huge ask. And we've had a lot of people from around the world really advocating for this more effective framework. It's the scientists, it's the parliamentarians, it's the politicians, it's the local mayors, the local communities, the indigenous people, it's the, those with disabilities, the elderly, the business sector, but it's also women. And they seem to have come from all over the world and the impact on the framework is huge. So by the time we get to Sendai, we hope we'll have a really good story and we'd love you to help us do this. Thank you. So I'd like to hand over to Laura Fugione to give a statement, please. Good morning. I thought I'd stand up a little bit to wake myself up and, and uh, Linda sang yesterday, so I thought I'd have a little song today for Linda, <laughs> my PR colleague from South Africa. So this is for all of you out there especially Linda. If I were a boy, <laughs> even just for a day, I'd make more than 77 cents a day. <laughs> I could go on, but I think I'm supposed to talk about something else at this point in time. I thought I was going to follow Maria, and yesterday when Maria was talking about uh, hurricane names and those kind of things, I wanted to make sure that she knew in 2017 the M storm in the Atlantic will be Maria, so we need to watch out for that one. I was, uh, I was kind of hopeful or worried this year the L storm was Laura, but we haven't got to the 12th named storm, which is good. 
but uh, I was kind of interested to see what Laura was going to do. At any rate, thank you so much for inviting me here to speak to you today. I'm honored to be here representing the United States and NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and the National Weather Service. I'm the deputy for the National Weather Service, the U.S. National Weather Service, but I'm also the permanent rep to the WMO. So I'm familiar with this room and how it breathes every now and then, and the uh, lighting changes. So um, there's no argument here that extreme weather, climate, water is unimaginable. Things are getting worse. As our population grows, we're becoming increasingly vulnerable to these changes. This presentation will try to discuss some of the action that we should take now to address these issues. And of course, I'm going to be coming from the perspective of a uh, national meteorological and hydrologic service. So we're learning, obviously, and we've heard about it, that specific populations are at risk. And so in order for WMO and the National Met Services to achieve their mission of redu reducing weather-related fatalities, we have to look at those more vulnerable populations. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to have the impacts that we expect with more accurate forecasts. First and foremost, it's not about getting the forecast right. If no one interprets the forecast, hears the forecast, knows the actions to take on that forecast, then we're not doing our job. We can have the most accurate and timely forecasts in the world, but it won't reach those end users and make a difference. So that's why we're committed to building a weather-ready nation. And here in the WMO and in this room, at times I talk about building a weather-ready world. I'm just going to hit every button and see if it moves, because that's not moving. It was, they were tricking me, it was turned off. So at any rate, Weather Ready Nation, this is our logo, and what does it really mean? It's about receiving timely, accurate weather, water, climate forecasts. And again, it means translating that information so people can save, we can save lives and livelihoods. Within the National Weather Service, it's evolving our operations. We talk about impact-based decision support services. And so I would not be doing my job if I issue a forecast and say it's going to snow this afternoon. But if I tell you that it's going to snow two inches an hour, and I'm not going to convert that to metrics. I think that's 24 centimeters or something like that. I'm looking at Michelle for that. Um, at any rate, if we tell you that it's going to be ex a lot of snow falling during rush hour, people will then be able to take better action and not be stuck in traffic jams or stuck on the road for 8 to 12 hours. So having that impact of what the weather's going to do will ideally help folks take more actions and save lives. So at NOAA, we're trying to look at this on three fronts. Again, before the event, during the event, and after the storm. We need to understand the root causes of this gender difference in risk communication, behavior, and social ind indicators. So how can we do this? We need to do a few things. First off, we have to create some baselines. Baselines of information for decision makers so we understand the vulnerabilities and we can track that change, assess the needs of the communities, and develop mechanisms for evaluating the improvement. We also need to integrate the social perspectives and the impacts of safety behavior into our weather and climate information. We also need to apply this knowledge in the design of policies that make communities more resilient. So these needs assessments correlate well with our goal and WMO's goal of making data open and accessible across borders. We collect and disseminate weather and climate information, but we also need to collect those social science observations as well so we can better understand those differences and track those social changes over time. As the highest ranking woman in the National Weather Service, it is certainly not lost on me that this evolution must also address the sensitivities to gender and the actual and perceived inequalities that exist. 
we're already taking steps towards gender differences, but not enough. In all activities, when we're planning, when we're developing, implementing products and services, we are deeply focused on ensuring the gender-centered social science education is also addressed, and we're putting that in the front of our research rather than at the back end of just when our forecasts come out. It's important that women be included in this conversation as well. Those of you that are meteorologists, when, you talk, when we look at ensemble models, ensemble models are when we take many different models and put them together to have a better solution. That's exactly what we're trying to do with gender. We need to make sure that the gender perception and ideas are a part of that decision-making process before the storm, during the storm, and after. Just like Irina Bokova, the UN UNESCO Director General, stated yesterday, educating women is educating a whole community. It's important that we include women in this decision-making process. We cannot overlook that they are needed in the data gathering and information dissemination processes to make sure that we're reaching all those different communication styles and perceptions when we're trying to get the information to that last mile. Gender is a central variable, and it cannot be overlooked. There are reasons for co this complexity, but research suggests that women have been shown to be more risk adverse than men, and men are more risk seeking. For example, when we look at these gender inequalities, men have a higher fatality rate, in fact, from 2006 to 2013, in regards to lightning fatalities, 81% of the U.S. lightning fatalities were men. So there's gender differences not only for women, but also for men. The vulnerability is largely related to mobility and roles, and we've talked about that over, the, over yesterday and today. As we saw, the poor are largely single mothers, homebound, and they don't organize themselves well as a group. They're worrying about the storm. Worrying about a storm that may never come is difficult when the primary worry is paying the rent and putting food on the table. In certain socioeconomic strata, people simply don't have the tools they need to act. For example, how many of you here in the room have taken a survival course? literally taking a survival course that teaches you as a woman how to survive in the event of a catastrophe. I have seen one or two hands. How many men have taken that same survival course? More men is often the answer. So again, we are not equipped often with the tools that we need in order to make sure that we can survive these extreme events. So that's why we're putting so much emphasis on the social sciences, which tells us why people do what they do and how they can react to these forecasts and warnings. Again, social science, whoops, whoops, went too far. So social science, recognizing how people, especially women, respond is as important as identifying their behavioral approach to preparing for these events. We have several projects underway to help understand this dynamic. One in particular is a synthesis of the risk behavior and communication research in context of severe storms, tsunamis, and hurricanes. The assessment focuses on the past 10 years of peer-reviewed research, which has revealed that within regards to risk communication before, during, and after the storm, women are more likely to be social with neighbors thus a key source of information, gathering, and dissemination. However, as a network, they're not used as a resource for preparedness nor mitigation. This assessment also includes recommendations for transitioning the research to application and to uh, create a continuum of lessons learned. So how can we apply this knowledge? Let me show you some perspectives from the United States. <clears throat> Climate change is not some distant threat, but is affecting the American pe people every day. In the U.S., we just released the third National Climate Assessment in May, and it is the most comprehensive, authoritative, transparent scientific report on U.S. climate change impacts ever generated. 
It reflects many changes and it's likely, and those changes that are likely to come in the future, such as infrastructure is being damaged by sea level rise, water quality and water supply are jeopardized, disruptions to agriculture are increasing, and many other items as such. Climate events also create conflicts across numerous communities. When we look at the state of California and the drought that Southern California is still in, it's creating conflicts between fishermen, wine growers, recreational users, and flood protection agencies, resulting in the need to assess the trade-offs of using limited water supply to satisfy the needs of all those different users. What's more important, the fish on your plate or the wine in your glass? You make the choice. So extreme weather. Even more importantly, changes in extreme weather are the primary way that most people experience climate change and say, oh, it's really happening. In 2013, for example, there were nine weather climate disaster events in the US, shown on this diagram, exceeding one billion each. These events included a drought event, two flooding events, whoops, sorry, two flooding events and six severe storm events. Overall, these events resulted in the deaths of 113 people. I'm getting a little clicker happy, I apologize. So everyone has a piece of the puzzle. And in the US, indeed, the world is faced with growing population risk and an economy that is increasingly vulnerable to weather, water extremes, an aging infrastructure, and changing climate. While it's important that we focus on the issues of gender and diversity, we must also recognize that there are pieces of a larger puzzle we're looking at new science and technology, the tools that are on the horizon, solving our dissemination issues, and gaining experience in social science and communication to that last mile. A huge unknown is how people will react to what you're telling them. Today's discussion demonstrates that we're only tapping on the surface of what social science can tell us. For example, how can we reach highly vulnerable populations even down to that city block? We know where we are headed. We will deliver more accurate information and meaningful forecasts. But we have to do that through improved information mechanisms, improved products and service dissemination, and improving the communication so we better articulate the risk, the uncertainty, and the impacts that help decision makers save lives and livelihood. Thank you so much for this uh, time. And I appreciate all of you taking the time out of your day to focus on this important issue. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, for giving us also this um, focus on social science having a role in this. Uh, and maybe we later on can discuss a bit on uh, this focus that now is heavily on women, again, maybe, what that means in terms of uh, being prepared or coping with or how we deal with disasters. Uh, when, what does that mean then for, for also for the men's side? Is this focus now given to women, what does it mean or is it the same, I would say, as we had earlier on when we were taking up the different needs of women, different approaches to, to better uh, meet their needs or issues. Uh, so how in the picture now have you addressed then maybe also men's side or what does it mean uh, in relation to that? Maybe we can have a talk later on, on that. But I would like to go on and give the word to uh, Maria Neira. She's the director of uh, at WHO on the environmental and social determinants and I guess we'll hear some more on social determinants. Good morning everyone. Thank you very much for the introduction. A real pleasure to be here and particularly to be part of a panel full of women, full of energy and potential positive hurricanes. All of us, the, the, the kind of good ones. Um, maybe you are expecting me to sing. 
No way, I'm not singing. But I'm very inspired by the positive energy generated by starting the day singing. Yesterday, the Deputy uh, Secretary General of, uh, of uh, WMO was saying that in South Africa, normally on a meeting, they will start by, by singing, and he couldn't go on. But as you see, women can implement. So I'm very happy about that. Good. <laughs> Okay, after this little provocation, and I'm happy to see that the Secretary General is sitting in the back, so he will pass the message. Women can implement. Thank you. Uh, we are for it. Let me now try to concentrate on, uh, after the, 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 the different scenarios, on the need for more research, on the policy action, on how disaster is, is bringing women now uh, into this and what are the national policies that can be very helpful. Let me now uh, take the, the health angle and see how health can be this very strong and powerful motivator for uh, uh, including more gender aspect into climate change. And uh, in fact, you probably saw that, that, that for us, for the public health community, the defining issue for public health during this century will be climate, health, climate change. Uh, the Lancet, which is a kind of, uh, I mean, is the, one of the most important publications for the, 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 the public health community, was defining climate change as uh, the, the big challenge of this century. And it's uh, very clear that there are many reasons for that. And one of them is that each year we have what we call in WHO the major killers, which are the undernutrition. Undernutrition is responsible for more than one million deaths every year. Malaria, more than 600,000 deaths. Diarrhea, still representing more than 600,000 deaths every year. And the stream weather events that are responsible for thousands of deaths, uh, of deaths uh, 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 as well. All of them, they have something in common. What they have in common is, is that they are extremely sensitive to a changing climate. So if you have all of those problems, and you exacerbate those problems by this uh, global warming, the, the potential for having a major public health crisis is there. In fact, the connections between climate change and health has been very well studied in the past years, thanks to a big community of scientists. And we, essentially, we came out with two messages. Climate change is affecting directly our health, because it's, and, and as well, indirectly, because it's touching the fundamentals of our health, access to food, access to water, shelter, and the capacity to uh, uh, breathe uh, air with uh, contains a minimum of quality. If you touch all of those pillars of our public health, obviously you will have very negative repercussions to that. In addition to that, through climate change, you will have better conditions for, for vector-borne diseases to be transmitted, and this is why we are seeing in some uh, uh, places around the world an increase, a dramatic increase on the potential incidence for having more dengue cases or malaria cases because the mosquitoes are having better conditions for their breeding and transmissions. The, 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 in addition to that, there are there is another uh, aspect of the equation, which is that there are health impacts of the causes of climate change. When you look at what is causing climate change, what are the, the, the emissions, the greenhouse emissions, they are responsible as well for outdoor air pollution. And yesterday I was um, here in this uh, podium, I have the opportunity uh, to, to say that one of the major public health issues we are confronting today one that represents one dead every eight is air pollution. If we look at outdoor air pollution, it's responsible for 3.7 million premature deaths every year, and uh, this is mostly because of urban exposures. But when we look at indoor air pollution, where Again, this is uh, related to the fact that people still use biomass and solid fuels to, to, to cook and to heat their uh, households. You will see that there, will, there are still 4.3 million premature deaths every year that can link to this very inefficient biomass and, and coal emissions uh, uh, generated by cookstoves or, or the way you, 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 you heat and you uh, uh, cook in your, in your uh, home. 
Um, therefore, this polluted and unsustainable transport systems, the poor diet, are major contribution to all of them, are major contribution to the non-communicable diseases that you know is now one of the, the, the public health change, uh, challenges we are dramatically facing. This has a different message, in fact. Um, if we look at who is contributing, what are the different sectors that are contributing to climate change and what are the health impacts, you will see that if we look at transport, you have one, more than one million deaths that are associated with, uh, with um, related to injuries or uh, traffic accidents or buildings which are contributing to the greenhouse gases emissions and they are as well responsible for this 4.3 million deaths, or industry uh, generating uh, deaths as well from occupational risks, or agriculture, or the electricity uh, for uh, electricity we use, all of them are contributors to these uh, greenhouse gases emissions, and all of them are major contributors to uh, um, he ill health, or if we put it the other way around, they can be opportunities to contribute to better health. So we need to make sure that all of these sectors are not exploding and generating exactly this. Now, I think we hear from everyone in the, in the podium, and, and I'm sure the participants, the health impacts of climate change are not equally distributed. And in fact, if we look at, at the countries where uh, uh, they, they, they are more affected by, uh, oh, sorry, this is not the one I wanted to show. Uh, there is a map in WHO where we said that the countries that are most responsible for generating greenhouse gases emissions are the ones that have less responsibility on generating this uh, uh, problem of climate change. So it's a major uh, problem of inequities, and therefore, from a public health point of view, something that we need to address. Um, some examples on the, on the gender difference uh, on the health risks and climate change. Women are disproportionately hit by stream weather events. Um, the publication of WHO on gender, climate change uh, uh, and health has been mentioned by the first presenter and very, we are very pleased of that. And from this publication we know that uh, women are disproportionately hit by these uh, wet, uh, weather extreme events. But at the same time, you hear as well that women can be part of the response, and it's not just a question of presenting her as the most vulnerable and the victim, but giving her, uh, the woman, the opportunity after the disaster to play a leadership, leadership role and, 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 and contributing to the solutions, and, and sometimes the solidarity and the networks that can be created are extremely important. Indoor air pollution is mainly killing as well women because they are the ones that spend a big number of hours at home and are the ones cooking and, and responsible for carrying the children. So there's, there, those are the ones that are more uh, uh, importantly affected. And uh, the direct impacts from increased uh, warning and humidity uh, represents that uh, there is higher female mortality uh, we, we saw that in, in the European uh, heat stress in, in the heat wave in 2003, maybe because uh, social isolation, but women were, women were more affected. And the, the social contacts uh, pro, uh, proved to be a, a, a protective factor against this uh, heat wave mortality. Uh, in Paris, the mortality, for instance, was very high among the all people because they tend to be alone without any social network protecting them. Females were a little bit more connected and therefore the social network, networks proved to be uh, protective. protective. Men may also be uh, more at risk of, uh, uh, of mortality, but uh, they are more likely to be active uh, uh, in hot weather. 
Climate Services for Health, this is the project we are doing in collaboration with the WMO, and that proves that many decisions made by, by the health professionals can be improved through a better assess uh, on reliable information about weather and climate. That's why we decided to initiate this initiative together, because we know that the management of the environmental determinants of health, like uh, ensuring clean water and sanitation, uh, uh, despite Water, water stress are extremely important for us, so th having this information in advance will be extremely important. The climate-informed diseases control programs can benefit as well, for instance, by using meteorological services to target vector control in time and in space. Or in case of emergencies and disaster risk management, there are uh, benefits as well of, of having in advance these meteorological and, and climate services information because we can then uh, strengthen our disaster preparedness and response from uh, uh, frequent uh, uh, floods and storms, for instance. Within the, 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 the public health community and, and the response we are trying to provide, what are those gender con considerations? There are proven cost-effective interventions that we are putting in place. In fact, it's a, it's a very common sense approach on, on, on generating uh, sensitive health uh, 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 services to the, to the healthcare communities, uh, vector control, better early warning, better epidemiological surveillance. And if you do that, you need to do it by integrating and make sure that you do that with a gender sensitive approach when you do your analysis about vulnerability or you need to uh, uh, provide uh, uh, information that will disaggregate data by sex, or you need to strengthen the, 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 the systems, uh, uh, the health systems, uh, and to make sure that they will take uh, 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 the aspects related to women aspects will be considered into that, and we need to ensure access to, to, to the people who will be uh, otherwise re requested those services on a, on a gender sensitive approach as well. The positive news here, on the, and I can't uh, avoid to, to say this message, I think is extremely important. Not all is negative. Again, not only women are most vulnerable and the victims in general, but they can take a very proactive role, a leadership role, and at the same time, policies that you put in place to reduce climate change, to, to, to tackle the causes of climate change, like uh, cutting carbon emissions, can bring major health benefits. And women are very stimulated by that because they, they are very concerned about their health. So we need to promote this gender sensitive health impact assessment. Reducing the, the, the climate pollutants will benefit as well, uh, air, will reduce air pollution and therefore benefit health. Promoting a sustainable urban transport will be good to reduce climate change causes, but at the same time will be extremely good for the health of the people. And the reduction in, in animal fat consumption, uh, well, this is maybe less related to climate change, but it still is one of those measures that can generate and contribute to create a positive vision for the future. The positive vision is that if you have a healthy urban transport, you, 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 you are able to have a physical activity, come, uh, 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 fight sedentary lifestyle, you will have a lot of health benefits and at the same time obviously you will reduce CO2 emissions, air pollution and all of the costs that, that are associated. In conclusion, we are very keen on, on going for a future with uh, 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 mitigation and adaptation strategies for health because we think want that to be uh, done on a very gender sensitive approach. Um, this gender sensitive approach will be our commitment is to go for a disaggregation on, on gender sensitive data disaggregation on all the programs we are doing uh, uh, from now on. It. And I think I, I have to stop here because uh, I'm afraid I went a little bit out of time. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Maria Neira. And we see that there is quite a bit in the pipeline in terms of gender sensitive considerations for public health response. And I'm also very much looking forward to see these gender sensitive health impacts.
uh, and taking that more into account with it, what that brings and what we can see from there. I'm happy now to give the word to Niri Volona Raholai Lichia. Sorry for pronouncing again, maybe somewhat wrong. Uh, and we'll hear some other aspect from a more specific project also. Please. Thank you, Elisabeth. Avant de commencer, j'aimerais quand même exprimer mes remerciements à l'endroit de Monsieur le Secrétaire Général de l'OMM pour m'avoir invité à cette conférence et pour, pour me donner l'occasion de partager avec vous nos expériences en matière de d'activités sur terrain dans le domaine du climat et santé. Mais tout d'abord, euh, en ma qualité de vice-présidente du groupe de travail 2 du GIEC, j'aimerais bien quand même rappeler un des résultats euh, importants du rapport du groupe de travail 2, surtout pour ce qui nous concerne, à la page 6, où le GIEC a accordé un, un degré de confiance très élevé pour cette notion de différence de vulnérabilité et d'exposition qui résulte de facteurs de stress non climatiques et d'inégalités multidimensionnelles souvent causées par un développement inégal et qui entraîne ensuite des risques différentiels. Et le GIEC a clairement euh, statué que les différences, les discriminations basées sur le sexe sont des facteurs de vulnérabilité accrus. Donc, pour ce qui est euh, résultat du GIEC, je m'arrête là. On aura encore beaucoup d'occasions d'en parler lors des activités de communication du GIEC, mais je suis ici pour vous partager les, nos expériences sur un projet qui nous tient à cœur euh, avec l'appui euh, de l'OMM. C'est le projet euh, Apprentissage par la pratique qui a été initié par l'OMM en 2008 pour le secteur euh, climat et santé. Et je vais brièvement vous présenter euh, quels étaient les objectifs et les attentes de ce projet, quels sont les aspects genres de ce projet, quels sont les intérêts de ce genre de projet et euh, les défis qui restent à relever. Donc, euh, ce projet pour Madagascar avait surtout euh, l'objectif de, de renforcer la capacité du service météorologique de Madagascar dans la fourniture de services, notamment pour les fournitures de services spécifiques pour un secteur, mais aussi pour que le secteur santé euh, acquiert cette habitude. L'objectif était même de, de l'utilisation des informations climatiques euh, soit vraiment des activités de routine. Donc c'était euh, l'objectif de ce projet et à l'issue du projet, donc, on devrait s'attendre à une amélioration des services fournis par euh, le service météorologique de Madagascar euh, et aussi une amélioration de l'utilisation des informations climatiques par euh, le secteur euh, santé. Donc, euh, on a commencé par mettre en place euh, un groupe de travail climat-santé et ensemble, nous avons défini les activités prioritaires. Et euh, parmi les activités prioritaires, on s'est mis d'accord qu'on a besoin de formation conjointe. C'était l'unique euh, stratégie pour qu'on puisse parler le même langage, le même dialogue. Donc, euh, avec euh, l'appui de l'IRI, on a organisé deux séries de formations conjointes. Et les modules de formation étaient euh, ceux de la Rice Summer Institute, mais adapté au contexte national de Madagascar. Et euh, à l'issue de cette formation, c'est avéré que les experts euh, de la santé ont connu quelles étaient les informations euh, disponibles, les informations climatiques disponibles, que ce soit au niveau national, que ce soit au niveau international, auxquelles ils auront accès. Ils étaient aussi familiarisés par euh, l'utilisation de la base de données Data Library de, 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 de l'IRI, en même temps euh, les bases de données de la NOAA. Ils ont maîtrisé les méthodes d'analyse et d'interprétation des données épidémiologiques et des données climatiques. Et surtout, ils étaient capables de formuler précisément leurs besoins euh, à l'endroit des météorologues. Et pour nous, du côté euh, secteur climat, on avait eu l'occasion donc de 
mieux comprendre le rôle des facteurs climatiques sur les, les maladies, notamment les maladies vectorielles, les maladies hydriques, et on était euh, mieux euh, disposé à répondre aux besoins spécifiques du secteur santé. Euh, ensemble, à l'issue de cette formation, on a identifié quelles étaient les priorités. Et parmi les priorités exprimées par le secteur santé, c'était le besoin de données climatiques sur les sites Sentinelle Santé, parce que le problème pour le secteur, pour tout ce qui est climat santé, là où il y a des données météorologiques, il n'y a pas de données épidémiologiques, ou c'est le contraire, là où il y a des données épidémiologiques, il n'y a pas de données climatiques. Parmi les besoins exprimés, donc identifiés ensemble aussi, il y avait les, tout ce qui est information climatique au niveau saisonnière et intrasaisonnière, et aussi les, les, les données à l'échelle sous-saisonnière, sous surtout les épisodes pluvieux, etc., euh, quels sont les aspects genre Donc là, vous voyez la photo du groupe de travail Climat Santé. Donc c'est un projet qui il y a un, un, une forte implication du personnel féminin, que ce soit au niveau du secteur, secteur santé. Sur la, à gauche, par exemple, vous avez euh, tous les, les trois femmes point focaux des maladies considérées, le, le paludisme, le le, le Rift Valley Fever, euh, la peste, il y a aussi le point focal recherche de l'Institut Pasteur, et au milieu, vous avez les ingénieurs météo chargés de l'élaboration des prévisions saisonnières et qui diffusent, présentent des prévisions saisonnières à la télévision et à la radio, et plus récemment aussi qui présentent les résultats essentiels du GIEC. Et cette implication du personnel féminin est aussi très importante au niveau local, et là, le personnel Central, ce sont tous des femmes qui euh, ont commencé leur carrière euh, dans les régions très reculées de Madagascar. Ce sont des femmes très courageuses, ce sont des femmes de terrain et euh, dont on a vraiment besoin pour le genre de projet euh, qu'on coordonne. Et euh, dans les, sur les sites sentinelles euh, climat santé qu'on a installés, on a aussi l'implication, forte implication du personnel féminin. Euh, il y a les sages-femmes, par exemple, et elles méritent vraiment l'admiration parce que travailler dans les endroits reculés de Madagascar, comme le Sud, ce n'est pas facile, mais elles sont là avec toute leur assiduité, leur bonne volonté. Euh, donc, une... il y a Elisabeth, il y a aussi euh, Lina, par exemple, ici, lors de leur formation, et Lina est là présente dans la salle. Euh, euh, elles méritent vraiment l'admiration. La, elles sont là euh, pour euh, faire les observations euh, météorologiques euh, quotidiennement, mais on leur a fourni aussi sur site des formations de notions simples en, en climat, les différences entre temps, climat, changement climatique, variabilité climatique, comment utiliser les, les, les informations climatiques, qu'est-ce qu'on entend par changement climatique, etc., pour qu'on puisse parler aussi le même langage. Et de leur côté, les médecins ont mené des campagnes de sensibilisation sur l'intérêt de ces stations d'observation climatique sur les cils sentinelles climat. Et ces jeunes femmes, parallèlement à leur tâche de sage-femme, ont à faire donc des observations climatiques trois fois par jour et aussi à communiquer les, les données, les informations climat et santé toutes les semaines épidémiologiques par l'intermédiaire du code CLIM. C'est un code qui a été mis au point par l'ACMAD. Euh, un autre, euh, comme je disais, c'est pas facile de travailler euh, dans ces régions parce que les trois euh, sites sentinelles qu'on a installés se trouvent vraiment dans des régions très reculées de Madagascar. Ce sont des régions euh, sujettes à des conditions météorologiques extrêmes. Ce sont des régions semi-arides, donc avec des problèmes de ressources en eau, mais... Dans le cas d'un cyclone tropical, on peut avoir des, 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 des inondations très sévères avec des, 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 des infrastructures vraiment minimales parce que les femmes doivent marcher de longues heures pour aller à l'hôpital et pour accoucher. Euh, les seuls moyens de transport, par exemple, sont des charrettes. Il y a aussi un grand problème d'assainissement parce que là, la rivière que vous voyez, ça sert en même temps pour la lessive, pour l'eau à boire et pour se laver. 
Donc, ce sont des conditions très difficiles avec des impacts graves sur la santé. C'est pourquoi on a choisi ensemble euh, ces lieux. Euh, mais aussi, dans ces régions, on a installé euh, les sites sentinelles. Ce sont des régions où il y a des grands problèmes de d'origine sociale sur l'inégalité des, des sexes et qui, euh, qui sévit encore actuellement, les mariages précoces, les accouchements précoces, les hommes qui n'acceptent pas les, les planifications familiales, les femmes sont responsables de, de tout ce qui est euh, moyen de subsistance, donc elles sont tout le temps dehors, exposées aux conditions euh, difficiles climatiques, ce sont encore les pères qui décident sur euh, tout ce qui est problème euh, sanitaire euh, des filles et des femmes. Donc, ce sont vraiment des, des endroits qui ont vraiment besoin de, ces, de surveillance locale du climat et de la santé. Donc, maintenant, quels sont vraiment les intérêts de ce genre de projet D'abord, ce sont des projets où on peut travailler avec, en partenariat, mais alors un partenariat effectif qui permet vraiment un dialogue franc, de collaboration franc. franc. Et c'est des projets qui permettent aussi de d'orienter plus facilement les services vers les besoins spécifiques d'un secteur ou d'une communauté. Et c'est des projets aussi qui permettent de vraiment d'impliquer, avoir un équilibre donc, pour l'implication des acteurs féminins, mais aussi des projets qui impliquent les autorités locales et nationales euh, du secteur santé, parce que si les autorités locales ont permis à leur personnel d'effectuer de, ces observations climatiques malgré leur charge de travail, c'est qu'ils sont vraiment sont convaincus qu'ils ont vraiment besoin des informations climatiques pour la prévention et le suivi des, des épidémiologiques. Mais la route est encore longue. Il y a beaucoup de, de défis à relever, notamment au niveau communautaire dans ces régions où il y a encore cette inégalité entre genres. D'abord, il faut éduquer les filles et les femmes. Il faut aussi un développement local très poussé en matière d'infrastructure, d'assainissement, de communication. Je crois qu'hier, j'ai bien entendu que les femmes n'ont même pas le temps d'écouter ni la radio, ni la télé. Et heureusement qu'à Madagascar, en matière de cyclones tropicaux, on est passé au code couleur, ce qui facilite déjà les choses. Euh, il y a aussi le défi d'alléger le poids de toute cette structure sociale basée sur l'inégalité des sexes. Et évidemment, le défi à relever, c'est la, la pérennisation des activités. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Miri, for uh, the insights in this case study and particularly for the gendered issues you are describing very well then. We are already a bit ahead in time, so uh, I would like the audience uh, to bring forward your comments or, or questions or remarks so that we can at least have some of in the interaction also with you. I see a word. As I think you have a, a micro where you can put. Uh, you see the... Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm uh, Dr. Vikas Desai. I'm a public health person from India. Um, my only uh, suggestion uh, towards uh, women and health and climate change is we are still restricting ourselves to um, diarrhea, malaria, uh, and airborne uh, respiratory problems. But with climate change, uh, iodine deficiency high fluoride in drinking water are also increasing and going to increase. And they are affecting endocrines. They are leading to permanent uh, disabilities in next generation. So this should also be, uh, these diseases or health challenges should also be included in when we talk about climate uh, change and gender things, because it also affects the reproductive uh, performance of a woman fluoride excess or iodine deficiency. A, um, in, in relation to disasters, there are, uh, uh, at least my city suffers from flood every fourth year. And uh, we have faced plague, post-flood plague, post-flood leptospirosis. So these are disaster-related resurgent infections, which probably needs uh, to be considered. 
and uh, I will highly appreciate uh, the uh, suggestions today that if we want to uh, do a to do a research for policy, then it should be a research on climate, health, and gender, uh, three together, and that indicates we need one a integrated research uh, for that, not bringing different different pieces of research together, but a well planned uh, multidisciplinary research. Similarly, we every country probably is in need of integrated training. That means training, as suggested by last speaker, training of epidemiologists for using the climate uh, indicators and claim training of meteorologists to learn about epidemiology and outbreaks so that it becomes a stronger unit for a given geography. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. I think that you're really right. Um, at the beginning, we three diseases were considered malaria, plague, and the Rift Valley fever. But now we consider all the, the so-called priority diseases at local scale. So I think that in the future, we are going to consider these, these uh, the all priority priority disease at local scale. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for a um, very informative uh, presentation. Uh, I've noted with interest that uh, when we, we, it's good and uh, we encourage that for example, the WMO and WHO are working together. But I think it's also important when we look at the puzzle to look at uh, zoonotic diseases. I have noted with interest that all the presenters have not indicated uh, working with the World um, uh, uh, Organization for Animal Health. OIE. And I think it's one of the areas that we need to be looking at, especially if you look at uh, zoonotic diseases. For, like, for example, listeriosis. It's not that common as a disease, but with issues of HIV, it's becoming an issue that needs to be addressed. So I think we need to look at that very closely. And I think I support uh, the proposal of an integrated research and also provision of data. For example, if you look at the Rift Valley fever, it's a zoonotic disease. Uh, the question is, do we have a vaccine to deal with that disease? Um, when it comes to uh, risk uh, reduction initiatives, are we able to identify those diseases because the problem is with the diseases that are not common, that the population has not developed immunity around that. How are we dealing with those issues? And if you look at most of the zoonotic diseases, they affect women because they are the ones that at home are looking after the animals. If an animal aborts, the woman is there to deal with that. So I think it's very important that we also include IOE in our strategic initiatives moving forward. Thank you very much. Thank you for bringing in this additional aspect. I agree that there is maybe quite a bit more in terms of health areas which are relevant. I think they also relate to these neglected tropical diseases as helminths. Maybe another one. You want to add something? Thank you. Thank you very much. And knowing that we don't have much time, I, I would just to say that it's extremely relevant. Yes, we have what we call One Health, which is a collaboration between FAO, WHO, and the, the organization OEA dealing with episodic diseases. So very relevant. And uh, maybe we can uh, carry on, on specifics on that. And related to the models for assessing the, the impact of climate change and diseases, I will invite you, we have just to produce a new report on quantitative risk 
developing the model that will, is allowing us to measure, as you know, it's very difficult, you know, the, the direct link between environmental factors and diseases. So maybe we can discuss later on, but it's all in our web page and uh, has been produced very recently and gives you the latest on the impact of climate change on, uh, on health. Thank you. Um, my comment is on the general approach to gender mainstreaming. We are talking about weather and climate information now, but we've been talking about gender in other sectors, natural resources, everything. We have strategies and policies at national level, but we need to evaluate how far are we doing this gender mainstreaming in all other sectors? Because if we're not doing it, we are not also going to do it well for weather and climate information. Like somebody was mentioning, we are doing research, we are not using it. My analysis is that in most programs, government, CSO, sometimes gender issues are not well tackled. And if it's not done, we are also not going to do it for uh, weather and climate. But for me, it's very important to look at the underlying causes of vulnerability to gender inequality and vulnerability to climate change generally, so that we're able to tackle issues of weather and climate and disasters and impacts and all that. And most times, uh, we are just looking at one issue without looking at the structural forms of injustice, the behaviors, the norms, and everything. And uh, we are also focusing more on women. Women need information. Women are going through this and that. We've been talking about that since yesterday. And we are not talking about men. For me, we need a transformative approach where we're able to question why are the men not there? And how can we engage men in these processes? We did a gender analysis recently in agriculture. And we found out that women contribute everything in the production value chain, and men come in to sell and plan and spend the money. We are giving women information to improve their productivity, to work for their families and communities, but why should the men get away with it, just selling food they've not planted, they've not produced, and all that. For me, the debate should be on how do we engage men as partners to support women and girls in managing climate change risks. So that is very important for me, and uh, that's what we should look at, and also look at the practical and strategic needs of women. They may produce the food, they may do this and that. Are they engaged in decision making? Are they benefiting from the adaptation interventions? So otherwise, we will give them the information, but they'll continue suffering, doing all the activities alone, doing the health care, doing the agriculture, and doing everything. And we need also to look at the cost benefits analysis of what do we miss as communities, as countries, if women are doing this alone and men are not engaged. So by doing that, we shall be able to strike a balance and make sure that all men, women, boys, and girls are playing equal roles in improving adaptive capacity to climate change and disasters. Thank you. Thank you for addressing this topic. Uh, I'm afraid I have to look at the watch, and my watch tells me we have to come to an end. So I would just comment that the issue of like filling deficits in, in regard to women's issues that have been that are necessary does not mean that we don't have to develop also a kind of a new approach which would be gender sensitive and would, would have to take factors into account you mentioned here i think there's some more in it how we would address men then in both in being prepared and in uh, for disasters or climate change as also for uh, response to it. I would allow one last <laughs> All right. one last comment and hope it will or, or I'll try to be very brief. Short, yeah. I, I wasn't planning to say this but um, I just well, first of all I want to thank the panelists every one of you were so articulate and eloquent and I think this is probably one of the best panels uh, that we've had so far. Um, and the link between climate change and health, and I just wanted to share a personal experience briefly because I uh, contracted West Nile virus two years ago during extreme drought conditions near our farm in North Dakota. We found a dead crow, 
it carried the West Nile virus, a mosquito bit it and bit me. And anything, I had extreme neuropathy, it was many months uh, demyelination, uh, like MS type symptoms. So it's a really awful thing, not just in the developing world, but in the developed world. And people um, just don't seem to get that this is related to climate change, these types of transmissions um, from wood ticks and Lyme disease, all that sort of thing. So we have a vaccine for horses for West Nile, but we don't for humans yet. And um, you know, what are those next steps? Where will we go um, for humans uh, all around the world, the importance of it? And so I felt that was really an interesting uh, link that you made, and I hadn't given it much thought personally until I experienced it myself. And the other thing, I had a question from Maria, and it was um, on your chart of climate change and the impacts, you had agriculture at 2.8 million um, uh, because of obesity from agriculture. And I often think, you know, agriculture, yes, we produce the food of the commodity, but it's also the food industry that processes this stuff into horrible food that we eat <laughs> that makes us obese. So those are just a couple of thoughts. So thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just would like to close now and thank this gender unbalanced that very informative panelists <laughs> and hope you enjoy the continuation of the conference. Thank you also for joining and, and uh, discussing with us. Thank you very much. Okay, at this point we have a 30 minute break. Um, I'd like to encourage you all to enjoy the coffee service at the bar. We'll start again at 11 a.m. We have, again, two simultaneous working sessions. So I really want to encourage those of you, we need about half the room to go down to Sal C1. We'll have Laura Fergioni there. Yay, Laura. Um, along with Elena uh, Villalobos Prats, another one of our representatives from WHO, uh, the head of the forecast division from Met Iran, Gerald Fleming, Emma Essel, Kerry Santos, who is an executive director of international programs at the American it's going to be a great crowd. Um, one other housekeeping detail. After the next set of working sessions, we have a two hour lunch break, and there is a lunch forum being held at 1245 up in the attic. It is by reservation only. We have only a few seats left. So if those of you who want to attend who have not yet signed up, please go to the registration desk during the break. Uh, and let them know and get, so we can get your name and make sure we get you a seat. Okay, thank you very much.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I think we're about ready to start the working session. Before we get started, if I can have everyone's attention for just a minute. Everyone? Can we ask people to move towards the front of the room? Because we have lots of seats right here and a relatively small group. I think you'll have a much better experience if you can come a little bit closer so the speakers can see you. They don't see these big desks in front of them. And come to the middle, to the front, and towards the middle, please. Just come on up. We're very friendly. Thank you very much. Keep coming. If I can have just a few more people, come on up. Come to the front. Come on. Thank you. There we go. Yes. Thank you. Terrific. We've got seven free seats in the very front here. You get a front row. If you have anything to say, you can say it. If you don't, you can just sit there and smile, make our panel happy. Come on. Come on. Okay. Welcome everyone. It is my huge privilege, not only having spoken in the high level panel, but to have you now in our ensuring capacity and enabling mechanisms for this session on public health and linking to weather, climate and gender. So it's a fantastic opportunity to have you here and I'm very glad you stayed to join our session our working session and not gone downstairs. Thank you all, real bonus, really lovely. So my name is Virginia Murray. I am speaking to you today as the Vice Chair of the United Nations International Strategy on Disaster Reduction Science and Technical Advisory Group, what a mouthful. But I'm also the Public Health Consultant in Global Disaster Risk Reduction at Public Health England. So I'm going to tell you that we have a whole series of questions to answer that have been presented to us by the organizers about the differences between women and men on how they access and use weather, about issues about health outcomes, a lot of which were discussed in the last high level panel, empowering women through better education, which is really important for ensuring capacity and enabling mechanisms, and how can we build networks to make things work better in the future. I'm just going to mention that as a public health consultant working for Public Health England, I need my partnerships. I was responsible for the heat wave plan for England in 2013 when we, we actually had a heat wave, you know, it happens even in the UK. So we had our heat wave, but we also provide a lot of information for members of the public who suffer flooding. So we've been trying to provide real frontline information with our many partners. But my best partnership is the one that I really find amazing. It's called the Natural Hazards Partnership, which aims to bring a one-stop shop to provide early warnings and extreme weather events and other natural hazards, which links from the government to public health to all our partners, including my good friends, the Met Office. But I know Mel will talk more about it, but I wanted to show you how it works. Because what we have every day is a daily hazard assessment. This is just a particularly bad one, 
that happened in December last year, where we had amber flood, wind, amber landslides, yellow, snow, yellow, all sorts of things happening, with wonderful maps looking at the areas that were most vulnerable so we could start sharing this with frontline information for people to, who are having to respond, because this goes to all our emergency responders. And behind it, we have a matrix of trying to understand what the risks are. So it's a fantastic arrangement. So what I'm going to now take you through to is how we're going to run this panel, noting that we really have to remember that 2015 is the opportunity to try and implement so many of the questions that are being discussed at the moment, from the disaster risk reduction framework, the sustainable developments, and the climate change agreements. So we have five extraordinary panelists who we've had the most marvellous time talking with, working together, who've got presentations of really high calibre. So I'm very proud to be the moderator of this session. And I'm going to start with Mel Harrismith, who's the head of civil contingencies at the UK Met Office. Mel, just press that button and you should be there. Oh, excellent. Thank you, Virginia. Virginia, good morning, everybody. Um, so this session, as Virginia has um, pointed out, is focusing predominantly on health. Um, I'm going first because I'm covering some of the themes that take on a wider remit. So I'll set some of the wider themes and then um, my wonderful panellists have the more difficult job of drilling down into the detail of health. So a couple of things that I'm, I'm just going to talk to you about briefly today. Quick look at risk. Um, looking at how we look at the cycle of turning science into services that can then be used for members of the uh, public to respond. And as um, Virginia has nicely set me up to talk about a little bit about partnerships as well. So why in whether climate change and health are we interested in risk? Um, in simple terms, uh, risk is the product of the likelihood of an event um, happening and also the impact that that event will have. And to echo um, Virginia and Laura from earlier um, this morning, in a growing world where likelihood and impact are increasingly affected by the way that humans shape the world that we live in, it is becoming more necessary to think about weather and climate change in terms of impacts rather than meteorological and climatological thresholds that we are more familiar with. Risk brought about by weather and climate change hazards is affected by many variables across both time and space. And understanding the contributing variables such as vulnerability, exposure, coupled with why risk exists in a particular location is key to understanding the nature of hazards and how they are potentially going to affect the country, the region, the community, or the individual. So drivers such as culture, lifestyle, age, gender, and individual health all affect the ability of an individual, whether that be a man, a woman, or a child, um, or a community to prepare for, respond to, and recover from a hazardous event. So by understanding risk, we can target our services to present risk to an audience in such a way that it facilitates decision-making and taking action. So in understanding risk, we can identify the impacts we need to warn and inform our users about. However, this is only part of the contributing work to enabling mechanisms to deliver services to our users. Understanding how science and services join together to enable users to make effective decisions is also part of an organization's capacity. Furthermore, assessing where the strengths and weaknesses are is crucial to drive development and improve service provision. So I'd like us to have a look at what I can only describe as a very, very simple cycle. Um, and this will look at four stages of bringing science to services, which then drives the response to weather, climate, and health events. So starting with detect, um, if we have a look at um, the mechanisms we have in place to produce forecasts, we can identify the strengths and weaknesses of the capability we have to detect if a notable event has the potential to occur. This can include having the necessary monitoring and observing and reporting networks to highlight when a particular situation is developing, such as the onset of the monsoon, the emergence of an infectious disease or early indications of drought. It could be that the infrastructure to observe these changes is there, but there is an inability to share that information with other key partners, such as the World Health Organization, the United Nations, governments or development agencies or local responders. 
And this could be the result of a number of factors, including technological or political. It could be that there is a lack of expertise to interpret the information that is available to monitor, observe and detect emerging patterns and trends. But if we have the ability to detect, we then translate that into forecasts. And turning the collected data into forecasts is the next stage. And at this stage, the forecasts could be hampered by a lack of skill or expertise, a lack of investment in modelling capability, inability to access the data that has been collected in the detect phase of this particular cycle. The forecasting capability may be present, but the lack of ability to effectively detect is missing. Or alternatively, um, the audience for the forecast that this service is, uh, sorry, the audience uh, for the services that come out of forecasting may not understand the information that's been given to them, or it could be that the information is not appropriate to the audience that it's aimed at, which is something that Laura was talking about this morning. So in terms of warning, um, if your detect stage and your forecast stage do not have any major weaknesses, then the next stage is obviously to put that into a warning service. This is where the science is turned into messages that can be prepared for the onset of an event. Assessing the strengths and weaknesses of the warning stage can again highlight potential development areas, issues preventing warnings being disseminated to potential users, not being recognised as the authoritative voice for providing advice, guidance and warnings to a government, and lack of knowledge around weather and climate in the media and public audiences, which is something we've already heard a lot about over the past two days. And of course there could be cultural and political barriers to cascading warnings. Looking at the response stage, here we're identifying the reasons why nations, communities or individuals can or cannot respond effectively to a severe weather event or a changing climate or an emerging health issue. If the warning stage is effective, why does it fail at the response stage? Are the warnings inappropriately communicated? Are there education needs across users? Are there cultural barriers? Are there lifestyle choices or enforced lifestyles that mean some aspects of society are less able to respond than others? So looking through the whole cycle and identifying strengths and weaknesses not only helps us as an organisation focus on the aspects of science to services that need concentrating on, helping us to prioritise our spending and resource effort in a world where money and resources are limited, but it also helps to highlight the areas where there could be an opportunity to share our best practice and to develop partnerships leading to a more holistic approach to science and service delivery. So there are very few organisations in the world who can deliver in isolation. I think we all rely on a web of supply and demand chains. And by looking at the cycle on the previous slides, we can see how many issues there are to consider when producing forecasts and communicating them to an audience that needs to take action based on those services. Many of the improvements and developments we can make to our science and our services come through partnerships where the sharing of data, expertise, best practice leads to advancements in science and service delivery. The particular example here on the slide um, is one from the Natural Hazards Partnership, which Virginia has already mentioned, um, and it's a consortium of public bodies, including the Met Office, brought together to provide information research and analysis on natural hazards, which in turn is then driven into make more effective policies, communication and services for civil contingencies, government and emergency responses uh, emergency responders across the community in the UK. Um, so one of the pieces of work that the NHP has worked on um, is part of hazard impact modelling and a particular piece within that is vehicle overturning. Um, and the NHP has worked with the Met Office and partners to develop a model that will take strong winds and calculate which parts of the transport network within the UK is vulnerable for large um, transport lorries and vehicles susceptible to being overturned by long, uh, strong wind. It produces areas of concern. Those areas of concern then form part of the decision-making tools that go into the National Severe Weather Warning Service and goes into the risk assessment, into the warnings we then deliver to the public, which makes them more aware of strong winds and the areas to avoid. By working in partnership, not only do we get to use expertise from other organisations, but we share resources, making developments more efficient and our services more effective for the end users. And in addition, partnerships encourage sustainable relationships where the partnerships extend beyond the length of the programme of work. So I've put these as recommendations, but they're really discussion points. And as I said, these are the wider themes before we drill down into more the health-specific issues. So it's around understanding issues um, around risk and moving on to 
developing partnerships, which means we can take a much more holistic approach to the way that we tackle disaster risk reduction. Thank you. Mel, thank you. Mel, thank you very much. That was really impressive. Can we now move on to Helen? Helen Massimo is the head of the Public Weather Services at the Tanzania Meteorological Agency. Helen, over to you. Yeah, thank you, and I'm very happy to be here uh, discussing issues on healthy. I'm a meteorologist, and also um, I'm an advisor on gender issues to the PR of Tanzania. Yeah. Uh, when discussing the, these issues of health and the ensuring capacity and the enabling mechanisms, uh, I thought of looking at a woman at rural areas than the women at the urban areas who have access to information, access to education, access to everything. But when we look at the women at the rural areas, why does this matter? It matters a lot because these women tend to have less access to resources and that could help them to overcome the existing vulnerabilities due to uh, climate change or environmental changes. When you look at the pictures displayed there, you may see the roles of women, even the children, when they come back uh, from schools. You may see the girls going to, uh, doing home activities than what, uh, school activities which have been given to their teachers. They'll be involving in various activities. And when you look at the information at the rural areas, when you look at that gentleman uh, from a certain tribe in Africa, uh, and you see a woman aside, listening to maybe she can grab some information from what he, the guy is discussing. But this, uh, tend to tell us that even if the women, the, we have access to various type of communication uh, uh, mechanisms, but there is a gap between women and men. And also, when we look at uh, the activities which are involved in rural areas, women uh, are more reliant on climate sensitive resources, looking at, at the activities if they're fetching water, agriculture, taking care of uh, animals or other activities to generate their active, uh, income, but they are really sensitive to environmental changes and also climate changes. So also, when it comes to natural disasters, yesterday we had a lot of how women are affected, a lot of talks discussing the impact, why women are more vulnerable. So we had uh, people saying that men will run first, but women will remain aside looking to the children, even if uh, also others tend to rescue some few items at the home. So gender differences appear to be greater, more severe to the women than men. And also women have relative lower socioeconomic status than uh, that of a man. This may be due to culture, or traditional norms and everything that are set aside to the, uh, to the society. So how can we uh, try to elevate the uh, awareness or enabling women in the society, especially at the rural? We need to involve the community. We need to reach the community at risk. We need to reach the community which are most vulnerable or the marginalized community. And also we need to engage ourselves uh, educating, talking to the community at the low levels, and also increase, also intensify the provision of formal education in schools, as it has been emphasized in uh, second millennium development goals, and also improve the existing education curriculum to make sure that whether climate and health issues are featured and are taken care of. And also, in the enabling, we need to enable the individual and the community to gain more control over their lives and shape the system around them. And this will help to reduce the risk that are associated with the climate change or environmental changes. And also, we need to bridge the gap which is existing between uh, meteorological um, 
sector and the health sector. We need to form uh, like what I called health working group, which will, will help in spearhead the use of climate information for health interventions. And also they will be involved in ident identifying the gaps and hold up on the use of climate information by health sector and identify the ways to overcome this and other things which they may see that it's important to be addressed. And also the health sector must take leading in the role in defining the requirement of weather and the climate in their sector. We meteorologists, we can produce the information, but we need the users also to, to tell us what to do, what information they need. So uh, forums like Global Framework for Climate Service, which brings uh, together the user, will help a lot in uh, bridging the gap which is existing between the climate services and the other sectors, including the health. And also we need to establish appropriate mechanism for dissemination of information. Looking at the community, what uh, mechanism, what dissemination channels are there? Local, can we use the community radios? Can we use the mobile phone? What mechanisms and what are the channels that are existing in the, in the, in the rural areas? Otherwise, thank you very much for your listening. A lovely presentation. Thank you, Helen. I'd now like to introduce the man on our panel. <laughs> Don't you think it's nice we've got a man? I approve. They're very important in our world. So this is Didikas uh, Nanmanya, who's a health geographer at the Ministry of Health in Uganda. Didikas, over to you. It's the right hand one. Thank you. Thank you. Dear moderator, I'm a health geographer working with the Ministry of Health in Uganda for now the last 14 years. I'm here representing uh, Julian Chumhanj, my boss, who I think thought it wise to delegate me as a man. She had other pressing duties. Uh, what a gender sensitive delegation it was. Uh, my presentation will basically cover uh, the first two questions which were presented, which were flashed at the beginning. Uh, the differences between gender and climate change between women and men. I also look at health outcomes as one of the key areas, and then I will give some recommendations. But at first, I will first give a uh, general background about climate change and gender in Uganda. Oh, moving. Yeah. I think I went so far. Uh, Uganda is one of the countries which is highly impacted by climate change, and we are experiencing uh, some of the heavy rains in the region. We are experiencing flooding, landslides, drought, disease outbreaks, especially malaria, and, and, and other diseases like cholera, dysentery. And then we have serious lightning strikes. They have been very recent, and they are very uh, persistent in the recent years. Um, gender, how do we see gender in terms of health in Uganda? Uh, this has already been defined. Uh, there are socially determined or socially constructed differences between men and women. It can also be broadly defined as socially ascribed characteristics of men and women in a given society. But we should remember that gender is different from sex. Whereas gender is uh, socially constructed and dynamic, sex is uh, biological, and natural. I want to bring the attention to this uh, diagram, which represents a complex uh, relationship between the gender aspects, the biological differences, the social cultural differences, and then I want to look particularly at the access and control of resources. As you can see, it is very important that we look at how these 
resources are shared and how they influence health in the face of climate change. When you look at the economic resources, we all know, it has already been mentioned, that uh, women are disadvantaged. We also know that socially, community resources and social networks are disadvantaging women. Politically, again, the political decision making, we find that there is an imbalance. Time, much of the time, women are overloaded with work. Then internal resources, I think this is being solved because we have women coming up in all spheres of life, engineering, medicine, politics, women are coming up. Then we have control of decision making. This is a big factor. In the home, when we talk about the home, the household, as a key decision making unit, we see that most of the decisions are made by men about women's health, about other decisions, <coughs> economic decisions. And all these affect health outcomes and responses. Now, let me look at the impact of climate change on gender roles in Uganda. What's the experience in Uganda? Of course, we know that like in other country in, in the world, especially developing countries, women are most vulnerable, notably in food security, water shortage, and fuel food scarcity. The women have to move long distances to fetch water, especially in the arid areas, in the rural areas. They are the ones engaged in cooking, uh, exposed to air pollution. This has already been mentioned by Maria Naria. Men have faced also some challenges, this I must mention, of self-esteem and self-worth. In some areas of Uganda where climate change has caused like landslides, men have been displaced together with women and children, and because they cannot provide to the family, they feel a challenge, naturally they provide to the family. But because they can't do this, it's a gender concern. Uh, that's why there's more of uh, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, and this is a gender issue. Also, some men and women have taken on non-traditional prescribed roles. Women are now engaged in income generating activities, which they couldn't get you, uh, to in the past. Uh, men are engaged in fetching water. This is uncommon in Africa. Men are supposed to be looking for money, but because of climate change, they're in a new environment, uh, they have to engage in some of these non-traditional roles, gender roles. There's also increase in malaria, which affects both men and women, but women bear the brunt of this, because pregnant women are more susceptible to malaria. They suffer the, the, the most looking after the sick, and so it is impacting more on women. Furthermore, we looked at, at the mandate of climate data. This is the second question, uh, which was flashed. How do women create, access, and use climate data? It's the mandate of the Met Office in Uganda. It is now the National Climate Authority. And it's the one in charge of generating data and disseminating it. It is important to note that access to weather and climate services has improved over the years in Uganda because of the proliferation of um, uh, mobile phones. There is a high rate of mobile phone usage. There is also a lot of FM radio stations in all the parts of the country. So information is uh, communicated in these means of, of communication the newspapers, the TV stations. So men and women who have access to these means of communication get regular updates of weather information. Uh, the usage of weather and climate services is critical for health outcomes, especially food security, nutrition, disease outbreaks, and prevention. Weather advisories are normally uh, given when uh, meteorological information is given. On a quarterly basis, forecasts are given, and they are shared with the Minister of Health. And we use this information in the Minister of Health to inform the districts, the lower level, the subnational levels, so that they can take, uh, they can plan, 
they can prepare for any outbreaks, for any extreme weather events. Uh, in case of malaria, in case of diarrhea, flooding, and so on. So they plan accordingly. Uh, now, I come to specific health outcomes. Specific health outcomes I've already mentioned include malaria outbreaks. These are very common because of the heavy rains, which uh, bring out uh, a good environment for malaria. Cholera outbreaks, dysentery are very common. Landslides and flooding with injuries and deaths have been very common in Uganda in the past few uh, years. But the most affected groups include pregnant women. You can imagine uh, a pregnant woman faced with flooding. She can't move easily. The children, the urban and rural poor, the elderly, the orphans, peoples with disability, refugees, and marginalized communities like indigenous people. We have isolated uh, indigenous people in the rural areas which are susceptible to most of these uh, health outcomes. What are the recommendations that I make out of this um, presentation? We need to improve collection, analysis, and prompt dissemination of weather and information to all levels with no uh, bias to women or men. I want to emphasize that. Both men and women need information. We need to create awareness about climate change and its impacts in the health sector. I must mention that in the health sector, although we appreciate, the top management appreciates that climate affects health, but they are slow in taking decisions to, to increase awareness, to give funds, to give facilitation in order to promote the linkage between health and climate change. We need support, improved utilization of weather forecasts, and other information by health sector at all levels to improve preparedness and response to extreme weather events. Uh, we need to increase awareness among men and women about causes of climate change and mitigation adaptation strategies. Government and private sector players need to integrate gender into climate change related interventions promote equal and mutual household decision making. I mentioned that most of the decision making is uh, skewed towards men. We need to change this kind of mindset. Promote gender sensitive adaptation and mitigation strategies, provide gender responsive, country specific technical support. At the YMO level or WHO level, we talk at the national level, but we need to look at specific countries with specific unique peculiarities, and therefore target technical support to help countries uh, tackle climate change. As I conclude, I would like to uh, mention that we need to work together. My conclusion is basically saying that both men and women, we need to work together. I have a one example which I want to share with you. We did a research and in this research in 2007, we found that communities which were severely affected by climate change, one of the adaptation uh, strategies by men or households was to marry off young girls in order to get money to purchase food to improve nutrition. This was extremely gender insensitive. So we need to target men and women, we need to work together. Uh, today I was watching the news and I saw that in the US, the Democrats have been defeated. And th the Republicans and the Democrats, the message is they must work together. We can borrow this in the gender and health aspects. We must work together in order to promote balanced climate change response. I thank you very much. Thank you so much, Didicus. That's really good of you. I now want to move on to Joanna, who is going to be talking from the Department of Gender, Equity and Human Rights from the World Health Organization. Thank you, Joanna.
Greetings, everyone. I'm here to make two points. One, to promote a gender analysis, and then two, to emphasize that gender matters. So I'll cover these four areas, but very briefly. Gender norms and roles. Weather and climate affect everyone, but not in the same way. Gender matters. Gender norms and roles can define where people are and the jobs they take. They often assign women the responsibility in the home. They can discourage women and girls from playing or being outside. They can discourage women and girls from learning skills, such as swimming or climbing. They can dictate levels of interaction with the opposite sex. They can determine levels of access to information or education. And they can decide level of decision-making or autonomy. So what? Gender matters. If we look at the example of the tsunami in 2004, the highest proportion of fatalities were among women. Why? Men knew how to swim, women didn't. Men were physically stronger and were able to climb trees. Women were indoors, taking care of the children, and were not able to save themselves and the children. Men were fishing at sea beyond where the wave had broken, so they were safe. Men were away from shore running errands. Women were bathing in the sea and therefore vulnerable. And many of the men had migrated for work. Don't get me wrong, we don't want to increase fatalities among men but we want to ensure that we reduce risk and fatalities for men and women, boys and girls. Even if information campaigns or health services are available, we have to keep in mind that women and girls may not be able to access them due to mobility or autonomy restrictions. This is from a focus group that we did in Pakistan, where the women said overwhelmingly, in our home, the household head decides about the attainment of health care. If he is not at home, we have to wait. And then below, from an assessment we did in Afghanistan, where the household was identified as the women's space. And once beyond the gates of the house, she's bound by the practices that limit her mobility. These are key factors to be aware of. Limited access to education, especially in low, socio low socioeconomic areas, means that women have less understanding of basic healthcare concepts or risks, and lack of awareness increases vulnerability. You'll see much of these pictures are from the Middle East, and that's where I was working for the past 12 years, so it's not, it's not a global bias or anything. So what is a gender analysis? Gender analysis is a process to systematically identify differences between men, women, boys, and girls in existing vulnerabilities to climate-related health impacts and in capacities to reduce health-related risks and outcomes before and after climate events. It's the process of gathering critical information, for example, looking at mobility restrictions, looking at the level of access to information, looking at the level of decision-making, looking at the level of participation, who does what, what spaces do men and women usually occupy? What are acceptable interactions? We need this information in order to have a gender-sensitive response. You're asking yourself why I have chickens on here? I wanted to give you an example of a gender-blind response, and that was a response to avian flu in Egypt, where the logical response was to call the poultry to spread the, the risk of infection. That makes sense. However, what was not taken into consideration was that many women depended on the care of the poultry as their only source of disposable income. And the information campaigns about the risks were not transmitted in a way that were understandable to the women. So what happened? Many of the women actually brought the birds into their homes, thereby increasing their exposure. The number of fatalities in avian flu over 70% were in women. They were attributed to two factors. One, their greater exposure to the birds, and two, their delays in health seeking. Gender matters. Key consideration. 
When we are doing a gender analysis, don't stop at the community leadership. Here we're consulting with community in an urban slum in Cairo. And we met first with the village community leadership, which were all made up of men, and we were trying to assess what their health priorities were. The men said very clearly, we don't get sick. Our children don't get sick. But we need paved roads. We need electricity. We need running water. Absolutely valid. Valid concerns, and those were their priorities. We asked to speak to the women to get the full picture. They had a different perspective. They told us our children get sick two to three times a month but we're not able to afford to take them to the doctor. We have to borrow from our neighbors or we have to sell our jewelry because we're hesitant to ask our husbands to increase our monthly allowance. We don't want to increase the pressure on him. But this was their situation. Even when the context is culturally sensitive or restrictive, we have to make sure women's voices are heard. Even when there's resistance, we will not get the full picture of the communities that we're targeting unless we look at both sides of the story. We look at every situation that would mitigate the risk. So then that leads me to the recommendation, which will come as no surprise, to use gender analysis to ensure that behavior change messages are strategically directed to all, to ensure that all are equally empowered, to contribute and adapt to solutions, to ensure all can access information and services, to ensure services meet the needs and capacities of all, so that the lives of all affected populations are improved and protected. Thank you. Thank you, Johanna, that's really clear. It's lovely to have the World Health Organization's voice. So now let's turn to the World Meteorological Organization. Halle Kudfal is Chief of the Public Weather Services. Thank you, Halle. Thank you very much, Virginia, and uh, hello, everyone. Um, as Virginia said, I run the Public Weather Services Program of WMO, and you may be wondering why I'm sitting here in a health-related panel and what does public weather services have to do with, with health. But in WMO, we realized a few years ago that health sector was one of the sectors that definitely could benefit from delivery of uh, weather and climate services. And in fact, um, uh, if you heard the presentation, very interesting presentation of Neri this morning about Madagascar, this was the project that we started here in WMO as part of Public Weather Services Program, and it has proved to be a really, really, uh, it showed us the importance of climate and weather information um, in health services. So uh, the focus of my presentation is that after all, uh, especially the high-level presentation this morning, you heard quite a lot about international frameworks and agreements and um, things on a global level, but I would like then uh, conclude probably the, the presentation of this panel this morning by taking you down to the smallest possible unit of a society, which is actually community, and very small villages or urban and rural areas and at, at the community level. And would like to focus on health, climate, and gender at the community level, and what is needed to help everyone to be able to enjoy a good level, acceptable level, of health and well-being. It's not just health, but also feeling well in, your, in themselves, in people having the capacity to go about their daily life and daily living uh, feeling well. And how to achieve this through building networks of meteorologists, climatologists, and health workers who could work together and to help people at the community level. So health matters, uh, and I would like to look at the role of a homemaker, and here we really are looking at gender, I'm not looking specifically at women. Some um, homes are headed by men, and some are headed by women as a homemaker. And what we would like to see is that a uh, homemaker, whether it's man or woman, his role or her role is to provide a healthy environment for the family, 
um, and to care for the overall well-being of the whole family. And this is the one health concept that Maria Nera from WHO um, uh, uh, brought to us this morning, and um, I'm reflecting the same concept that uh, this One Health concept is targeted at everyone in the household, from babies to elderly, and it includes, it's not only concentrating on diseases and how to deal with diseases, but on nutrition, clean air, clean water, overall hygiene, and also sickness and disease, which includes both the uh, health or diseases of animal origin, as Linda pointed out this morning, as well as human beings. And finally, physical safety, and that includes the shelter, how to be protected from environmental elements. So um, all of these are really concern, concern of uh, a homemaker. So how to achieve this? Um, we know that in urban areas, probably it is a lot easier to go and get access to information. Um, there are more modern ways of accessing the, in the information, probably more um, uh, institutions that can help. But at the uh, village level, uh, it is important to have groups of professionals and volunteers who can um, help with the well-being and health at the community level, and these really need to be two groups of people. One is people like nurses who are trained to actually help with disease and disease control and when people fall sick, but there's another group which is equally important, is environmental health workers who are um, paying attention to uh, weather and climate, and these are specialists to understand the impact of the environment on the health and well-being of the, of the community, of the society. And that needs capacity development and training. We need to train professionals, again has been said over and over today, um, uh, professional health trainers to go and then train other people in health matters in villages and remote communities and to teach the homemakers on the importance of one health. And that includes, as I said, from nutrition to disease control. Importance of developing a network of also here women meteorologists, climatologists, health workers, who can then have exclusive address to women on, in, in those uh, areas, communities, where women are excluded due to cultural norms that we have been hearing today. So it is very important while we are concentrating on both men and women, but keep in mind the special needs of women where they really cannot have contact with men freely and easily. Um, also, the network should concentrate as well on, uh, with families to help them how to keep hems themselves harm, uh, uh, away from the harm of hazards, uh, and these are natural hazards, probably uh, whatever happens to be the uh, severe weather uh, and their impact in the part of the world where they live, and what steps to take for their own protection and how to respond to these hazards. And therefore, this will also result in a more aware society and a household to multiple and cascading hazards which will result from a severe weather event um, and for their safety. Therefore, I would like to propose a couple of pro uh, recommendations. One is to develop in a network of cross-trained professionals, and that means, as Niri said this morning, health workers who understand weather and climate, and uh, environmental scientists who are cross-trained in health matters and to be able to um, understand that, but work as extension workers. And this is very common in agricultural meteorology and particularly in WMO we have and we promote the concept of extension workers who go and work with farmers at the, at the really grassroots level. And we can do the same thing in, in health. And secondly, um, deploy these extension workers to educate and to advise on improving the overall health and um, well-being at the community level, at the family level, at the individual level, through raising the awareness on the impact of environment, weather and climate, but also nutrition, clean water, clean air, and uh, individual as well as collective um, hygiene and all of the impacts that these matters have on health. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Halle, thank you very much. We are now on to the discussion phase, but I need to point out to you that at 12 o'clock the translation will stop. Absolutely that
our translation. Could you please put up your hand now, because the translators will go non-English. Anybody in a language which requires translation, because we lose the translators at 12 o'clock. Nobody? Nobody has a question in another language? We would love to have a question in another language. We really seek your help. Anybody who'd like to ask a question? Okay, the translators, I think you will be able to go at 12, and I can't thank you enough for your help. And please, we hope that you'll all understand if we don't make it as clear as it could be if you need translation. So huge thanks to the translators. You've been extraordinary. If I can just go back to my slides for a second, please, if we could go back to the slides for a second. Thank you. I can just see them being put up and just now. I just want to say that we're on ensuring capacity and enabling mechanisms. And you've heard five incredible panelists pointing out what they think would be useful. I just wanted to remind you the questions um, that Didicus rather complained about that I flashed up and down. I do apologize. I thought they were quite complex. But if you feel it would be helpful to have these questions up on the screen, to try and focus your questions when we're discussing the real issues of enabling capacity and enabling mechanisms for this section, would you just put your hands up if you'd like these up on the screen, or shall we just go to a general discussion? Anybody want these questions up? Right. That's fine. Then we can take them off the screen and let's go on to doing the discussion properly. Thank you very much. for your. We can take my PowerPoint off now. Thank you. So, please, could we have any questions from people to our wonderful panelists who might be able to give you some more thoughts about taking things forward? Is there any questions from, from the right-hand side of the room? Anybody want to ask a question? I particularly like questions from people who have not asked a question before, if it's at all possible. I saw, I know there's a hand there, I'll come back to you, but is there anybody else who'd like to ask a question? Okay, could we have our Indian, sorry, did I, oh, Chris, can we start over there? Two questions, right. Could we have the gentleman first and then the lady in the beautiful pink? Yes, thanks, Chair. Uh, I'm very interested in the, the network uh, uh, raised uh, by the Helen. Oh, OK. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Madhav Karki, and I'm from Nepal. Uh, this session is on capacity building and mechanism. And uh, I think very good presentations have been made. But I think often when we say capacity building, we sort of uh, remain at abstract level. We don't really get into what capacity, especially women, need, uh, especially in developing country. And by that, what I mean, I have seen that capacity building often are targeted on women who might represent urban society or even rural elites. And that capacity doesn't filter down to really help the needy. And that capacity doesn't get translated into solutions. And I heard this morning that it's uh, not enough to provide weather service. We have to, uh, to have that service translated into solutions, I think, by women uh, or by women's organization. So, I would like uh, the in life to be sort of educated or perhaps um, enlightened how the panel thinks the capacity uh, can range from technical capacity building, institutional capacity building, and of course individual capacity building, and how that capacity building can be sustained because once you train somebody and uh, that person and we can't stop this because they trans they, there is a turnover, they 
to change career, they go. So how do you really sustain the capacity so that solutions remain there? Okay, that, that's my question. And my second is, of course, the outcome. Uh, I think the, uh, it was very well said uh, that I think we want to see uh, that everyone work together. Now that uh, is that when women get capacitated or men get capacitated, how the society as a whole gets benefit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your, for your question. I won't go to the panelists yet. I think we'll take perhaps another two questions so we can get the panelists' view because I think they will all want to address that. So. Thank you. I'm sorry <laughs> to, <laughs> to interpret uh, in advance. So uh, my question is, uh, I'm very interested in the presentation raised by um, Helen, uh, uh, she raised the, the network developed by the WMO. So my question is, uh, is the network was uh, led by, what was the developed by w, WMO, uh, or what's the mechanism to encourage the other stakeholders to involve, to cooperate? So, uh, you know, uh, uh, some, uh, and also, uh, is this the routine project or just only a pilot project uh, for the network? Thanks. Thank you very much. I think we'll have a lot of network questions. I think that's a really nice one. Hallie, we'll ask you that in a minute. Could we have a third question, please? Anybody else want to ask a question? Did I see an... Ah. Oh. We... Could we have the question from India, please? Oh, Madam. Yeah. Uh, my, one is my concern and two are questions. My concern is, uh, again, uh, maybe a little repetition, but uh, it is stated that urban area has uh, easy access to information, which is not universal. Urban area also has a pocket, like cities in India have 30% uh, in slums who do not have, though geographically it is easy to send the information, but you, they don't have in reality access to information. So that also is a vulnerability which we need to recognize. Uh, there is a, a, a very good and strong uh, feeling and we should put it into recommendation about the cross-trained professionals need. We need cross-trained professionals. And uh, to, to do that, Maybe uh, the curricula, pre-service curricula itself needs to incorporate the uh, cross subjects so that they come out with the uh, capacity. And last is, uh, there is always a wisdom li lying in the society how to act during disasters and during climate change, which also needs to be respected when we, we talk about science. So there is a need to converge the society's uh, experience experience-based science to the uh, science and then work on the recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. I think those are really useful questions. We've had three questions that I will now ask each of the panelists to address. Um, Hallie, you would, if you could talk about your network in a second, but if we could get comments from each of the panelists on capacity building sus specifics and sustainability at all levels. So the professional development as well, if we could include that at that point. And then there's two questions about resilience in, in cities and elsewhere, but also acting in disasters. How do we do that best? So can I start with you, possibly, Joanna, to talk about capacity building, specifics and sustainability, and professional development, if you would. And I'll move on down the line, if that's acceptable. Sure. And to give sufficient time, I'll focus on the sustainability, because I think sustaining capacities is a tremendous challenge. To sustain capacities, you have to put it to practice. And we're building capacities here in communities to respond to an undetermined event in the future. It's not something they can put into practice. I think through refresher trainings, that is, is one key way to do it. Through simulations, that is one key way to do it. Of course, that incurs quite a resource obligation. And 
as far as I know, there is no other mechanism to do it. And, and my main principal work is mainstreaming. Part of that work is capacity building. And one problem with sustaining that capacity building is if the mandate is not there to support it. But this is a different situation altogether in communities. Again, that capacity to risk, to respond to risk, cannot be sustained unless it's put into practice. So I think there have to be regular mechanisms for them to practice these. Even with the first aid training, you take the training and I would say like two months down the road, those skills are lost unless you're putting them into practice. So I think it's very important to take into consideration before all those resources are invested in capacity building, what would be the mechanism to sustain those skills and to put those skills into practice so that they become ingrained. Thank you, Joanna. Helen, could you possibly, from your experience, look at the specifics of training and sustainability and how you do professional development? And if you've got anything to add on how you would prepare for resilience and disasters, just a shopping list. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, when we talk about the institutional development, now, uh, in my perspective, we'll be looking at the ability of the, for example, the national meteorological services to produce the uh, information for the users, building the capacity in terms of uh, e educating the meteorologist, understanding the information the user needs, and that one is sustainable within the institution. But when we talk about the individuals, in my perspective, we need to tell the community, the community need to see the benefit of the information. If someone sees the benefit of information, will be able to use the information and that information because it's helping them uh, to gain, they gain something, they see the value of that information. So it will be sustainable. They will be needing the information so they can reduce the risk that uh, uh, risk that they are facing. So, for example, if someone gets the information that if uh, I'm doing a business, maybe um, I'm just a vendor in the, in the street um, doing a business, and if I get the information that tomorrow it will be a uh, raining day, I'll maybe reduce my product which I'll, I'll be selling in the, in the street. So I'll reduce the loss. So if I get the information and I see the value of information, that is the way of sustaining the information. They need to see the value of the information and also that one will be uh, used and it will help them to believe in the, in the information and it in a one way help to build the capacity. And when we talk about the disaster reduction, uh, this one need to be, you need to have the whole society approach. And as my colleague from WHO said, we need to do like simulation, tabletop, exercise. But in disaster, it's a whole society approach. We need the respondent to be there. We need the early warning system to be there. And also the preparedness and also the political willingness. So when we talk about the slums, we need some people, pol politicians who will be talking to those people and educate them the uh, risk they are, they are, which they are facing. So the whole society, if it's involved, I think we can reduce the risk. That is on my perspectives. Thank you. Helen, that's lovely. Mel, so can you look at capacity building? <laughs> Uh, thank you, Virginia. Um, I think the first thing I would say about capacity building, and I think the point you were making was around the different areas that you can have where you can build capacity. And I think for me, the only way to do that effectively is to look at it holistically. So there's no point building capacity in an observing network if you are then not building capacity in a forecasting network, in a warning network, et cetera, et cetera. And there's also no point building that capacity if there's no way of translating that into a useful service to either the general public or the people who need to respond into a disaster. So that's why I think it needs to be looked at holistically. From a sustainability point of view, um, I think my colleague on the far end was absolutely right. This is a very difficult question. I think it's something that we all recognise is very difficult to actually implement. But I would suggest that some of the key points around sustaining capacity is continuity whether that be a continuity of, of knowledge, so at the point when capacity starts to be built, making sure that corporate knowledge um, 
knowledge around how um, the capacity building has been brought into place and making sure that continues through the people who are going to come and go through various projects and making sure that that continu continuity of knowledge remains in situ. And also making sure that um, uh, there's continuity in the people who are using these services around understanding why it's important and understanding why there's a need for capacity and making sure that people are engaged mm -hmm. constantly. And that takes time, it takes effort, it takes energy, and it, and it takes passion. And that can be hard to keep going when things aren't perhaps progressing at the rate that people are interested in. And that comes down to human nature, which, as we know, is very difficult to, uh, to deal with. Thank you, Mel. Not totally positive, but certainly challenging. <laughs> Could I go straight on to Didicus? Because I would love your version of how we do capacity building, specific sustainability, professional development. And if you could add in a bit on resilience and disaster risk reduction, I'd be very grateful. But we need to be brief to make sure we get as many questions in as we can, if that's all right. Thank you very much. Uh, when I look at capacity building, I look at it holistically also, and I would like to use the example of the capacity building which has been done at the local uh, rural level. Here in Uganda, we have a lot of capacity building in terms of financial management, building of savings and credit associations at the rural level and they have been very effective. You find rural women in a group, saving money, finding one person who can record the money, and they borrow, and they do business. This is something we can build on, in terms of passing on information, training them how to use this information, and how to plan for adaptation. I believe that we can also use this kind of platform to document indigenous knowledge which they have, put it in the local language, see how they can use this information in order to plan for climate extreme events so that they can build their capacity at that level. At the national level, of course, systems are already made. Uh, the national climate change units are there. We have policies which integrate gender and all aspects of capacity building, the trainings, uh, which uh, my colleague has already mentioned, all those are already in the framework. But we need to look at the affected people at the grassroots so that we can build their capacity in that perspective. And I propose we can use existing structures, like I've mentioned, and I'm sure in other developing countries, this is the same thing, to, to, to empower the women and men. Thank you. Thank you, Didicus. That's very clear and a good idea. Hallie, I know you've got lots of comments on all of this, but if you could particularly quote on the network to make sure that we've covered some of the issues that relate to the network. Uh, I wonder if you meant actually the, the project that we had similar in the health and climate um, project. Um, yeah, that was actually a pilot project that we uh, started in Madagascar to test the idea, to see how we can do this, what kind of resources we needed, um, and how successful it would be. Um, I am pleased to say that in Madagascar it turned out to be extremely successful because there was really genuine willingness by both the med side and the public health um, ministry to uh, bring the two sides together and they realized that there are cases and diseases where they really needed um, weather and climate information. Um, and we did this with very, very modest resources, I must say. This did not require a huge amount of uh, resource. It, does, it did require the commitment, as Neri explained to you. These are people who live in very difficult conditions, and they were willing to um, um, go and collect information, data, etc. So, um, and since then we have tried this in few other places, in Tanzania actually, um, Helen can probably tell you a bit more about it, uh, but we have started something like that here as well. The idea is taking shape that they should also have um, climate and health working group. I know that Judy can tell you that in Kenya, I think there's a thriving climate and health working group still, I think, going on. So um, I think in most parts of Africa, actually, the, the idea has been very well received. And we need 
we need a catalyst, and I think that is what WMO was. We did not bring a lot of money or equipment or flashy new, I don't know, um, uh, hardware, software, things like that. It just, we just went and brought people around the table and encouraged them to talk. And that's how it whole, the whole thing started. And it has been very successful in Madagascar. Thank you very much. I think that's really encouraging what you've achieved. And I think it's something that is reproducible even in Nepal and maybe in other areas, possibly even in India. Do we have some more questions for the panel? I know we have a question over there. Um, anybody else have a question that I need to see? Please, can we come back to you and have your question? If you could share your name with us, that would be very helpful. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Linda Makuleni from South Africa. I think my question is um, maybe more of an observation. Um, um, I think it's also important uh, that we, when we deal with uh, this issue, we look at an integrated approach in terms of the different disciplines. Uh, that are necessary for us to come up with uh, the necessary applications that will help people to deal and plan and manage the risks that are related to weather and climate, specific, specifically for public health. For example, we, I don't know, we might consider to have a platform where you have uh, the professionals in the medical field, the epidemiologist, entomologist, because you are dealing with some of these diseases where vectors are also involved, a specialist in terms of weather and climate, and also the communities themselves, so that we have an understanding of what is really uh, needed and how that information is needed. The other part that maybe we also need co to consider is people, the linguists, people who are specialists in different languages and in terms of communication on how these messages are communicated and interpreted. Thank you very much. Thank you, I think that's a really useful comment. And I think the message about different languages and also the value of different specialty groups working with others is really key. And I know you talked about the veterinarians and the One Health programme. If there's a question at the back there, could I have that please? Yes, this one works. My name is Lesha Whitmer, Business and Professional Women International. Um, and this is more like a, a, a query, if you know about it, and if so, if that might be a useful instrument. As some of you may know, there is a water and health protocol connected to the UNECE Water Convention. And one of the nice features of this protocol is that they have national platforms with national government, local government, different ministries, civil society and NGO groups, including women groups, in quite a lot of countries. And I don't think it would be very difficult to add one more um, way of looking at it in the mix uh, and look at the uh, climate impacts that they would have. So those are in existing platforms, very effective. Um, at the moment, mainly in, in um, the ECA region, so Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Um, and I think that could be a very, very useful model and it's connected to an official international treaty so it is also not too difficult to get the attention of the countries. Thank you, that's a very powerful message. From the disaster risk reduction framework we too have national platforms and national focal points on disaster risk reduction and possibly they need to talk to each other much more closely Many of the national platforms sit inside governments, like our UK one, which sits inside our cabinet office and is led from there. 
and links very closely with the local frameworks, and health is very much part of it. So it depend, the models are very different in many countries, and I know that there are 85 countries that have national platforms under the Disaster Risk Reduction Framework, and we hope with the new framework there will be more countries who will take that on. But maybe linking to the Water Convention might be a good way forward as well. So I think that's a very useful comment, and it might fit with some of the needs for the WHO, WMO climate agenda, which might be very helpful particularly if we get the three frameworks to talk to each other more effectively for next year. That's very useful. Do we have other comments from the floor that would be helpful to try and take the idea of capacity, ensuring capacity, enabling mechanisms to go ahead that we could take forward as part of our recommendations from this meeting? Because um, there's some really helpful ideas already. There's one at the back. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much to all the panellists for your, your presentations today. They've been really informative and, and really useful. Um, one of the, my comments would be, um, I'm with the Met Office UK and I work in the International Development Department. And one of the challenges we, that we have working uh, internationally with National Met Services is that a lot of the funding that's out there for capacity development tends to come after the um, provision of technical equipment, bells, whistles, radars, etc. And I think what we're trying to do um, a little bit more is to um, use capacity development as a means to um, upskill uh, National Met Services to use what they have currently and to understand what kind of equipment they may want to use in future, but to really develop the skills initially to understand better what kind of IT design they will want for their Met Service, how they can standardize all of their equipment approach, and then um, then look at a capacity development program once that equipment is in place. and. A lot of the funding can be very focused immediately in program delivery of just delivering equipment. And I wonder if there is a way for us to change that approach uh, institutionally to really look at having the first stage in program development to focus on capacity development, if that makes sense. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I wonder if the WMO would like to respond to that, Ali? Thank you, Virginia. I will try. Um, first of all, I'm very, very, very happy to hear that comment because this is a this is a problem I think that exists in a lot of the developing countries, med services, where uh, they either get assistance, aid, um, donations from um, uh, donor countries and other development um, agencies. Um, I think in WMO now service delivery is becoming a priority, has become a priority the past few years, but it, is, it will become one of the formal priorities of WMO. And um, that means you really need to look at what you want to do with all the equipment and modernization of your med service and what services you are going to be able to deliver. That means understanding the needs of the society and the users and then tailor what you need to be able to deliver those services. Traditionally, everybody has been very happy going along and giving um, very probably uh, costly, expensive, sophisticated hardware to uh, countries that um, without sustained support, these have not always been able to function. And once they break down or you run out of uh, usable um, consumables, uh, then they just are sitting and gathering dust or rust. Uh, but we are trying to change this mindset really to try to, first of all, as you said, to try countries understand what they have, how they can homogenize and harmonize the equipment in, in, in a way that um, they can make the best use out of the existing equipment, but also uh, we put more uh, emphasis on the services that will be delivered, what capacities are needed 
to be built among the staff of the med services to be able to deliver those capacities and then what we need actually in terms of hardware to be able to match those services that are required and I know that a lot of the development agencies such as particularly the World Bank is now looking at um, assisting countries in that way and a lot of their projects they have got the end result in mind before they start uh, with the um, supply of um, the equipment and, and the hardware. Thank you. So a really pertinent question, Larry. Um, okay, any other final question? Because then I would like to ask the panelists to give a, just a minute of feedback of what they think are the most important recommendations that their presentation and this discussion has pointed out to them, if that's acceptable. And I'll start from Didicus's end in a second. But is there any burning question from somebody who hasn't spoken yet? Okay. Can I start then with Didicus? Can you just give us a, just your key points? I, now I see a hand going up over there. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Agnes Kijazi from Tanzania. Uh, let me take this opportunity to congratulate the panelists for a very informative presentations. Mine is not a question, but I just want to support a few points that were raised in this discussion. And one is on the uh, training, especially at the women at the rural areas. Uh, usually, uh, currents you have seen that we have training in form of workshops, but uh, these workshops are at the urban areas. I think there is a need now to organize workshops at the rural areas so that we reach those uh, women at the grassroots. And another point I want to support is on the uh, issue of having these extension groups on weather, climate, and health. The way we have in agriculture to make sure that we have those ones in, a, in a health. I think this is very important. And the third one is on, the, uh, on considering the needs of women. We are talking of, uh, of gender and trying to look at both men and women, but we know that there is a special need that is specifically for ladies. It's important to pay attention in those needs. It is raised there, and I want to support that one. Thank you very much. Thank you for your very helpful comment. That was really useful. So if I could turn to the panelists for their final summing up. Didikas, are you happy to start? Just a minute. Thank you very much, uh, moderator. Mine is that uh, we recognize that health, climate change, gender are complex processes. And they need to be taken as such and dealt with in an integrated and concerted effort, including both men and women. But keeping in mind that we need to build the capacities of both women and men, we need to build the capacities at different levels, right from the grassroots up to the national level, even a global level, so that we can be able to tackle the challenge of climate change. I thank you. Um, I think I just go back to the recommendations that I had put on before that we really need to um, not to forget, and it was raised again, not to forget the um, needs of people in very remote and um, I would say sometimes half forgotten communities. Sometimes, as you said, it, this might in fact be in big cities, uh, and I did not mean to say that big cities, everybody has access to everything and there's no problems. But um, sort of communities, whether they are in rural areas, whether they are in um, corners of uh, very large cities, they really need a special attention. And I um, would like to emphasize again the need for cross-training um, and having extension workers to be able to go and teach people on the relevance of environment and its impact on health. Uh, 
I think for me, one of the biggest things, is, um, as I've already said, is about the holistic approach. So the end-to-end -end approach from understanding the issues and the risks, the geographical spread with issues there that Hallow's just talked about, um, from equipment to forecast right through to services, um, to make sure that people can prepare respond, recover, and learn from disasters that they're affected by. And to do that by working in partnerships where people can benefit from expertise from our neighboring partners and make a stronger service delivery offering. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I need to emphasize, as my colleagues uh, have said, we need to work together because everything goes back to health, whether it is disaster, whether it is warning, whether it is food insecurity, all things goes back to health. So we need to work together, the health sector and, and the climate centers, so we can uh, make use of what we have and understand the needs and save uh, the community. Thank you. Thank you. I think this will come as no surprise what my recommendation is again, but gender matters. It influences the risk, it influences capacity, it influences the response. It's a key variable, variable for consideration, and it is often overlooked. So unless gender analysis becomes a systematic part of any disaster risk and reduction project, we risk not reaching everyone in our community or empowering everyone in the community. Thank you, Joanna. So I would like to wrap up this session to say a huge thank you to WMO. I'm really delighted that WMO have put in this conference on the gender dimensions of weather and climate services. I think it's much needed, it's very timely and very appropriate. I think our five panellists have given extraordinary, vibrant, clearly illustrated, well-presented presentations and I'd like you to thank them all, but I would also like to thank the participants who raised really good questions. I am delighted by the idea of very local capacity building, to the use of really clever networks, to the idea of better national platforms and partnerships of how we can try and build this to the future, particularly as we move towards 2015 and the three UN landmark agreements of disaster risk reduction, sustainable development goals, and the climate change agreements. I think your inputs have been really key to how we might take this forward. And as a public health professional myself, a woman, so I'm a medical doctor, very much involved in the health care I could not do my job, I could not have done it when I was the head of extreme events without the very close collaboration I've had from all my Met Service colleagues in building together a, national, a, na a natural hazards partnership, which is a model that you might all like to consider as a way forward for sharing, for learning, for taking forward some of the best practice because our natural hazard partnership, even in the UK, is changing as we speak to make a better service, to make it more available and more accessible to those who really need it on the ground, and to make sure that people know how and when to use it. So huge thanks to you all, and I'd particularly like you to thank my wonderful panellists.